OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, very good morning to you. Welcome along this Tuesday morning. Yeah, hopefully you're all back at work if you remembered to uh, get up instead of after the four-day holiday just lying in bed, uh, a bit grossed out by all the chocolate you ate. And uh, it feels a little bit like um, Kim Jong-il in Team America World's Police. I'm a bit lonely here, Owen. You're not, you're not with us this morning. Uh, no, I'm not. How, how was the chocolate eating? Too much. Bit gross. I'm, I, Talk I, us through it. I'm ashamed of myself and everybody else that was involved, which was just me. <laughs> what what was what was your go-to thing on Sunday that made you well, feel all this guilt? Well, uh, uh, I guess it was the fact that I didn't get any strike. I had to buy my own. That was the worst part about oh, the okay. thing. And so therefore you kind of overcompensate by having a little bit of everybody else's, you know? <laughs> Which one did you go for for yourself? The uh, chocolate orange twirl. The orange twirl. Wow. Yeah, that was pretty good. It's amazing. It's amazing that that's telepathy right there because I was literally just about to say that I I spied one this morning uh, lying around the house and I was like that looks good for breakfast. Well, what's what's uh, yeah for one hundred percent and what's what's your review out of ten? Uh, it's pretty good. It, yeah. <laughs> it, it was it was pretty good. Yes, it okay. was. Uh, okay, but that's that's my plan for today then. It looks amazing. What else? What else did you have? Um, let me just think. Let me just think. Oh, there was an M and M one. The, 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 there's got a new one, a salted caramel M&M one, oh, which nice. is out now. It's, yeah. Like, I mean, is, is it like stabbing my culture in the back to suggest that a Nestle egg is actually just as good as a Cadbury's egg on a, on a Easter Sunday these days? Because I certainly enjoyed it. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was a little bit disappointed. I was thinking, you know, is this going to not live up to, to, our, to our usual standards of Cadbury? But actually, it turns out that they've managed to nail the egg these days. You're polyamorous when it comes to your uh, egg liking. I will 100% accept anything that comes to me as long as it is free. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I mean, that's the whole point of having a, a magic bunny that delivers eggs that they're free, <laughs> right? No one, no one pays for these at any point. So, uh, well, that was a bit of a tangent for us. Um, how are you, Owen? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, after 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 that weekend, you know, as we as we just already established, I think uh, once we once we get through the sort of. Uh, Dirty mire of Easter and managed to get back into some sort of routine. I think we'll all be. I think we'll all be pretty happy, right? Yeah, I think so. Some, something blew us off course horribly over the last week or so, and uh, you know we're all trying to grapple with the fact that the championship started. You're clearly down in Kerry, getting debriefed ahead of the championship about what you can and can't say when it comes to the Kerry Mafia. That's why you're not here this morning. The the football power rankings will come out this week. There'll be an emergency one where Kerry are suddenly fourth on the back of. Tyrone's stunning second half, 15 minutes bit where they had all their best players in the field and they're clearly just slowly warming up. So they'll be first. The Dubs will have Conor Callaghan back and Mayo will be Mayo and you'll be like, yeah, no, I think I can stand up my rankings with Kerry fourth, right? That's a really good argument that you just made there. Mayo are going to be Mayo. Uh, that, that is, that, that's the, the level of incisiveness that I can provide to dampen expectations here over the next little while. Uh, like I, I, it does, it does feel that there, there are column inches still reserved for that National League final, isn't there? That people are still talking about it to a certain extent, and maybe people just want to see this whole thing actually explode into life over the next little while, rather than dealing with the big issue, which is that Toronto are just the best team in the country. Did you see that on Saturday night? Like, I mean, we, we actually haven't included them in our performance rankings here. But like, did you see that? Like that, that was a sort of when people talk about, you know, the the ladies and gentlemen, we are back once again this year moment of 2022. It is not the Limerick Carlos. It is it is Tyrone on, on Saturday night saying screw you to everybody else, especially Fermanagh. They were insulted by the mere presence of Fermanagh, who had the cheek to take an early lead in that first half and said, you know what, we may not have a whole pile of depth. We may not have uh, all these players that uh, you, the public, are so concerned about this year, but we're still going to hammer Fermanagh. We're still going to do this all in one half and we're going to win this Ulster Championship and do back to back for the first time ever. This is a this is an angry version of Tyrone. They've had so many reasons to say we've been written off left, right and centre. Maybe this was actually the real story from the weekend. Well, I mean, who knows? We'll get into that a little bit later on. We'll certainly get into it later on in the week. In the meantime, at 7.34 this morning, if you've got any interest in being involved in the show this morning, we'd love to hear from you. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. You can also leave the, uh, use the hashtag OTBAM or leave a comment on our YouTube stream. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock. We have our performance rankings. Mark Lawrence is going to join us at 8 o'clock. Sports pages at 20 past 8. Sports news with Colin Milani at 8.40. The latest on the Hurling Championship at Will at 8.50. Uh, Quiddy's going to join us at 10 past 9 to look back at the weekend's rugby. Look forward to what's going on over the next couple of weeks. And then we'll get some analysis from James O'Connor around about half past nine. But at 7.35 this morning, it is time for the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. 
You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. Ooh, all right, well, this is uh, our stereotypical, traditional, uh, at this point, uh, Gillette Labs performance rankings where we have three different slots. One is green, one is red, and one is amber. Uh, who have you put in the red this week, Owen? Well, uh, what a surprise if we start with the Premier League. Arsenal and Tottenham have let themselves down in dramatic fashion. They've uh, taken the ball and they've run with it for a little while and then they've tripped up and they've fallen flat on their face and it feels like both of their seasons are in serious jeopardy to varying degrees. I think it's fair to say that Arsenal's season is in more jeopardy than Tottenham's season. Tottenham have been less bad for the last three weeks post-international break than Arsenal have been. But Tottenham still got beaten at the weekend. Tottenham uh, got beaten by a good Brighton side, let's not forget. But their defeat has led to questions about every element of their team, not least Harry Kane. Questions by Gabby Bon Lahore, of all people, saying that the way he was playing was as if he was jet-lagged. And you know what? Maybe he was jet-lagged. Maybe he hung around those azaleas a couple of days too long and uh, and stayed in Georgia eating peaches or whatever you do over there and just, just was not up for it. Was not up for Brighton and Hove Albion last weekend. And he decided, you know what? We are Tottenham. We are Tottenham. We need to to, to finish the season in an underwhelming fashion. Or maybe Matt Doherty's injury is the thing that's blown him off course. Maybe our irony has actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy and Matt Doherty actually is very, very, very important to how Antonio Conte wants to play. And his absence blew them off course a little bit. Or maybe they're just Tottenham and they will let you down at various points. I should reiterate here that Arsenal have let themselves down in greater fashion than Tottenham have over the last couple of weeks. But the end result here might well be that Manchester United sniff around and end up finishing top four. The team we have absolutely ripped for months and months and months. The the punchline of the Premier League this season the, the team that consistently get kicked, and punched and spat on by everybody because they're so bad and the team that are broken and a club that is a, a, a walking cracked badge is going to finish fourth because Arsenal are Arsenal and Tottenham are Tottenham. And I don't even know what to say anymore about, about Arsenal in, in that duopoly of grimness. But it is very, very, very predictable, even though a lot of us didn't predict it because we got carried away once again because we're sports fans and we're idiots. You make it sound like we've been treating Manchester United the way you guys used to treat each other during PE classes in the same, apparently. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a, that is, now that is a tangent. Yeah, the PE class in the same. Well, not me, really. I mean, uh, you would have heard that piece between David Clifford and Darren Moynihan last year. Playing indoor soccer in, in their socks, that is lethal. That is that that is an ice rink. Um, well, actually, no, we, we would just go out with our shoes on and kick each other's shins, which I guess is probably worse than uh, playing indoor soccer in your socks. But uh, either way, not for the faint-hearted. School shoes, no runners allowed? Oh, yeah. No, no, it, well, like, I mean, it, it depends what the day was. I, I don't know why so many people came so ill-prepared for PE, actually, in hindsight. It was a timetable slot every single week, and you could bring a gear bag. I don't know uh, why people... Like, those lads were carry minors. I mean, at least I had some excuse by not being very good at, at uh, football. But uh, those lads should, should have had gear available. Um, I guess and, uh, and preparing for stuff is uncool when you're, like, a 17-year-old. That, that is actually a very good point. And, uh, oh, look yeah, at him. You know. he got, he's prepared for this thing, which we have to do every week. <laughs> oh, what he a loser. Life seriously. Yeah, exactly. Wow. I mean, this guy's got actual ambition in life. He yeah. packed okay. the school bag this morning. You can't have that. No, you're definitely not allowed that. Sorry, I mean, this is just a way of me uh, um, segueing into this because I haven't spoken to you since. That, that was, it, it did sound like those P- PE classes were like skin and teeth and hair and everything you just <laughs> described, Manchester United. Yeah, they, they were a little bit. There was definitely a few kind of like in-class rivalries that would get exacted on the the hardwood of uh, of that uh, of that basketball court, which be, became a, a, an inner soccer class. And um, and yeah, it, it seems that, that that those guys also had it. It seems to have been a, a constant thing that was passed down from from year to year. Of course, some people were smart enough to just you know avoid it and play left back, um, and that would have been the smart thing to do. And then other people just ended up having their shins broken. That was you. Or, uh, you were the left back, were you? No, no I, I wouldn't say so. I, I think our class was it was particularly un, um, untalented. You were the nice so guys. Actually, 
So you all kind of uh, looked out for each other. No, oh God, no, not nice guys at all. Just on, just lacking in talent, sporting wise, completely. Therefore, my crapness was less crap relative to my teammates slash classmates. Okay. Okay. So I, I was, I was actually okay. Okay. Um, I've been giving you grief for your team of Werner Take, and you weren't here to bask in their glory of eventually it coming uh, through. But in fairness to you, uh, for every bad team of Werner Take, you've been all over this Arsenal story, like completely <laughs> reluctant at any point to accept that perhaps they were coming good finally under Mikel Arteta. You were like, no, it's not going to happen. No, stop this. I refuse, to, I refuse to be hopeful, even though we've got one of the best collections of young players in world football at the moment. No, what's going to happen here is at some point, they will crash. And uh, they have been crashing fast and subsequently slowly ever since. It was like, I, I didn't see any of the game because there were other bigger, more important games. It seemed it seemed like you could ignore the slate of, of kickoffs on Saturday in the Premier League quite happily with all of the rest of the, the sport that was going on in the world. But you couldn't, it turned out, because no. uh, it was unbelievably, unnecessarily dramatic, particularly on the part of your beloved Arsenal. What the hell's going on? Ah. Uh. Like it's it's amazing. It it just goes. It's a fantastic case study of how important depth is. And in in a way, like I don't want to make excuses for it, but you can kind of see why they would have entered this season with a pretty tight squad. They'd missed out on both of the crap European competitions last season, which was like you know party time. Can focus on Premier League only this season, and you don't need to worry about the Conference League. But when you enter into those in, in terms, you kind of got to realise that you're not going to be able to play your squad players. And I guess Arteta allowed the squad to thin out a little bit and make the required signings. But he also should have seen that there was a proper top four battle coming after Christmas. He, he would have seen that there were games postponed before Christmas. He would have seen that fixtures were going to start piling up to an extent after Christmas. And the, the thing I would really be unhappy about if, if I was a hardcore Arsenal fan was the fact that uh, January was a bit of a wasteland, transfers-wise. That, that's the moment he should have said, this thing is in grasp. Do what Tottenham did. Tottenham saw that something was, was, was possibly up for grabs, or maybe they were just backed into a corner by a new manager who actually had balls to say, listen, we need, we need signings here in this January transfer window. And they went out and they got them. And even after that, Conte was like, this wasn't enough. We didn't spend enough. We, our squad possibly isn't even strong enough. Arsenal did nothing in that January transfer window when they should have known, Arteta should have been the guy who knew that if Kieran Tierney gets injured, that guy who plays left back in, in replacement for him, Tavares, who we got a good look at earlier this season, isn't good enough because Arteta thinks that a couple of games ago he played Jack at left back. I know Tavares came back in at left back at the weekend and did all right, but uh, he would have looked at the midfield. He would have seen that if Party and Jack would go down or if one of those guys go down or if one of them lose four, more, more importantly, potentially, then there, there's not going to be enough backup. It, it was as if, you know what, we've got uh, four good attackers and we've got one good attacker on the bench. That is all that matters when it comes to depth. But actually, there's a hell of a lot more to it when it comes to that. Players come in and out of form. And unfortunately, one of those players who's gone out of form massively was, was Lacazette as well. And they don't have a number nine. You can't score goals. You're screwed and they just haven't scored enough goals this season a quick look at the table will tell you that 45 goals this season united have scored 52 spurs have, sc spurs have scored 56. who's going to finish fourth tottenham okay it's hard to... still back tottenham i just think like manchester United are playing liverpool tonight they play arsenal on saturday not that arsenal are uh, an overly tough fixture anymore um tottenham do have to play liverpool as well of course but like i, I think that they just have to even in the aftermath of being beaten at the weekend, I think that was a blip given the, the form that we've seen from Kane and Son recently in particular. Uh, they've been amazing. They're, they're the, the, the best combo attacking-wise uh, if you compare them to Arsenal or, or Manchester United. And I would say there's a bit of a distance actually between them, despite the fact that Ronaldo um, statistically actually doesn't look as bad as some people are saying this, this season. Yeah, the uh, couple of hat-tricks towards the end of the season will certainly bail out your stats and um, maybe make people reconsider piling on you the way they had been for a while. Let's move on because uh, the core curlers in the red, is this fairly obvious? Was this a, a difficult decision for you to make? Not really. Like I think it was just a question of our cork in the red and our limerick in the green and it's, both of those things are true. Like it's it's interesting. There's, this is not the most important part from Sunday, but it is intriguing looking at the league scoreline compared to the early championship scoreline. And it is early championship. Conditions weren't proper summer just yet, although they looked decent in Cork. Like it was 219 to 113 in the league in favour of Cork. And then it's an 11 point defeat 
in the championship. So even this idea of laying down markers in the league just clearly didn't exist because it seems we're back to square one and, and square one being the aftermath of last year's All-Ireland final where Cork's manhood has been questioned, the, the manner of their defence, the level of work we're at from their forwards, the short passing around the defence has come under serious scrutiny. They do have a week off to get it right, but it hasn't stopped some of the, the bashing from within the county, which is deserved to, to, to a great extent, you'd have to say. Like, just w one of the articles that, that I saw this morning was Tony Considine writing in, in yesterday's Echo, and he was wondering if they'd bring something different to this championship. And he says, you know what, being in Cork early on Sunday, most of them were showing no confidence whatsoever in this Cork team or its management. He says defending their goal is very poor, no real cutthroat defending, playing as individuals, no savaging the man with the ball coming through, uh, proper defending, doing the basics all absence. He says Kieran Kixon needs to be more ruthless. He's a sound man, but he has to get a bit more ruthless. Uh, and on it goes. You can read it online. And when you've got people like Constantine throwing uh, the boot in this early in the championship, you know that this season's either going to be one of those we took, we proved you all wrong and they come back in flying fashion, or it's going to be a bit of a nightmare. It, it, the latter, you'd have to say, is more likely. I'm not saying the other eventuality isn't going to happen, just by dint of the fact that they're in Munster. And yeah. Waterford also look good. Okay, well, the other thing is that um, I, I so I can't remember now. Somebody in the papers today is making the point that if they're going to win the All Ireland, it, it might have been Column Keys, that if they're going to win the All Ireland or compete for it, they're going to have to come up against Limerick, potentially two more times already in the championship. If they make it through to a, a Munster final, which obviously looks unlikely after you've lost your first game, but it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. Uh, and what are they going to do that's different from what they did in last year's All Ireland final and what they did at the weekend? It's just very difficult to see anything being recast at this point. We'll get into this a bit more with Will and we'll talk a bit more about some of your comments coming through. Very quickly, some of the early comments. Uh, Liverpool versus Manchester United will tell us where United are really at, says Stephen. And Yassin says Spurs will finish fourth. Manchester United barely scraped a win versus the bottom of the league. And they have Liverpool, Arsenal and Chelsea in their next three games. Their season is over in the next week. I mean, uh, do Chelsea care as much anymore about those league games? I don't know. They obviously have the potential to finish the season disrupting the quadruple drive from Liverpool's perspective and I have a feeling that they're probably going to be maybe they'll be playing for uh, positions and starting positions and that and that'll keep motivation high uh, what about the Haaland news overnight asks MJ Maloney imagine how many goals he gets at City under Pep Dubai money is being well spent again Ger and then it's a uh, cry laughing emoji cry laughing emoji times two just in case you didn't get it so the male were the ones who were uh, reporting an exclusive this morning that terms have been agreed between Haaland and Manchester City and that Manchester City will now uh, trigger the release clause of whatever it is, 67 million and he's going to be paid half a million a week so it's 26 million basic salary. The fact that terms have been agreed doesn't mean it's a done deal because other people can then also agree those terms. It just means that uh, it looks more likely than not that Haaland will move in the summer um, and it certainly means that City are right there, ready to go with it. Are they the only team in the world who will match those terms? I don't know. What, like, and will this significantly alter things if Haaland joins? Like, how many more goals can the team score than they're scoring at the moment? Mm. And also as well, how does it impact how Manchester City actually play? Like, I think maybe back in August, September, the excitement around Haaland would have been a 10 out of 10. Whereas now, not that people wouldn't be excited about Haaland at all. It, it just there, there is that slight caveat about how Manchester United or Manchester City have been playing recently that it's been effective without having that out and out number nine. If they want to win the Premier League, if they want to win the Champions League, and then all of a sudden they've got an out and out nine coming into the team, it does impact. It makes things more interesting for them, but I'm not sure it has the massive leap forward potential about it that maybe some might think. Of course, he would be arguably the best player in the team. But I, I do think that the net gain from having him in there wouldn't be overly substantial. It would just make them stronger favourites for the Premier League next Well, season. yeah, they'll, they'll win every game against mediocre mid-table opposition yeah. by an extra half a goal over the course of the season on average. So let's move on. We'll, we'll talk about that more with Mark Lawrence in about 10 minutes' time. Uh, what is in your amber? Well, Kyrie Irving is in the amber, and to be honest with you, if I had it my way, he would well I actually pick these. Uh, he would be in the green, but uh, you know, we, if we can leave a, a <laughs> if we can leave aside, you know, a whole pile of things that 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 he's said, like he he's got to be as a player, just as a player, one of the most watchable entities in world sport, especially when it gets to playoff time. The NBA playoffs started last week. Uh, Kyrie playoff Kyrie, for example, gave us 
moments like the, the 2016 comeback for Cavs against Golden State. And of course, LeBron gets the headlines around that for the block laid on in that game seven. But it's about that deep three pointer from Kyrie Irving in that game, that, that clutch three pointer. And he's done that so many uh, times in his career that made that series so magical, that game seven so magical. So if you're looking for an NBA bandwagon to hop on, this series between uh, the Boston Celtics and the Brooklyn Nets is the one to hop on. It has been absolutely electric so far. Game one was on Sunday night, and it felt like game seven of an Eastern Finals. Remember, this is just round one. The crowd in Boston Garden was absolutely raucous. Like Most of their beer-filled rage was, was targeted at one person, and that was Irving, because he left Boston in pretty acrimonious circumstances in 2019. Uh, and I'm not sure if you've been to Boston Garden before Jared, but it's even if it's somebody who's really really nice they get absolutely destroyed if they're their best player or their most recognizable player like i was there in 2018 when uh yanis and milwaukee were there and yanis is one of the most likable world superstars and he got absolutely destroyed by the, the the boston crowd they just hate anybody that is good that is against their team in that uh venue like there's a bit of a, a grim element to that as well like irving had mentioned in the past that there's a subtle racism that exists for players in Boston, obviously, anything that you watch on the Lakers, uh, Celtic stuff from the, the the past would definitely touch on that theme. Baseball players have mentioned that they feel that exists at Fenway as well. Uh, and as an aside on that, there was a video doing the rounds yesterday from Fenway Park where there was an F Kyrie chant doing the rounds at a baseball game. So the whole city of Boston right now are united in their hatred of Kyrie Irving. And this goes back to the playoffs last year. He had a bottle thrown at him at the Garden after stomping on the Celtics logo in, in, in the, the middle of the course. Uh, Brooklyn ended up winning that series 4-1 last year. There was a bit of a gulf between them. But this season, things are different. The seeds are exactly flipped. There is two versus seven, but Boston are the two seed this year, and they managed to get uh, the win in game one with a buzzer beater from uh, from Jason Tatum. The the main thing around this, though, is, is not so much the buzzer beater, even though that was absolutely extraordinary. The main thing was Kyrie versus the fans. So he's getting booed all the time. At one of the moments, and you can see all this in social media, he's standing on the sideline and he puts his hands behind his head and flips the double bird at the crowd and then proceeds to make fake crying motions uh, to, to, to the crowd as well. There's another moment where he sings the tree, shows the middle finger to the crowd <laughs> directly after sinking it. After the game, then he's walking to the locker room and, and some guy backstage, I'm not sure was he working in the garden or what, is, is filming Kyrie and someone shouts, Kyrie, you suck. And Kyrie is like, suck my dick. Uh, and then he, <laughs> uh, so he's just having none of this. He goes into the post-game press conference and he's like, there's only so much you can take a comp as a competitor. We're the ones to be expected to be humble uh, and take a humble approach. F that, he said. It's the playoffs. This is what it is. So if somebody's going to call me out in my name, I'm going to look at them straight in the eye and say if they're really about it. Most of the time, they're not. Embrace it. It's the dark side. Embrace it, he said. And I'm totally with him. He played amazing on, on Sunday night. He scored 39 points while on Ramadan. Like the game uh, tipped off at 3 o'clock Eastern time at, on Sunday. So he's been brilliant while on Ramadan, by the way. That's one of the weird Kyrie Irving statistics. But he was a little bit statuesque as Tatum burst past him to make that layup. And it was a layup at the buzzer to win the night for, for, for Boston in game one. This is going to be an unbelievable series, everyone. Just watch this. Game two is on Wednesday night, uh, obviously in Boston as well. And this is just such a great beef. Is this a, they're all best of seven now? Do they fix that or is it still best of five for the for early part? Yeah, all best of seven from okay. round one these days, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but it's a great one for this for this series. Okay. Uh, what's in green? Green. Okay. Two-legged rugby. Um, I think this has been a success, hasn't it? Like, and even if you can point towards some of the series where it wasn't a success, I actually don't care. I actually think that even when it comes to the Champions League, we just totally forget the ties that are over after game one. I, I think that we just remember some of these unbelievably absorbing ties that go the distance. And that's the adjective I would use to describe them that is absorbing because you just get brought deeper and deeper into the storyline of these 160 minutes. Like Exeter and Munster definitely had it. Toulouse against Ulster had it to an even higher degree. Obviously the Harlequins situation was 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 on a level above that again and it just feels like the stakes are so much higher after more rugby is played it's like our brains get tricked into believing that this is more important because the thing has been happening for a longer period of time it's like if there's 10 minutes of additional time played at the end 
of a football match. If you score a 109th minute winner uh, or a 99th minute winner as opposed to an 89th minute winner, it all just feels that just more dramatic. It's not true, but it just feels like that's the case. And that really felt like the way it was for, for these two-legged affairs. It's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what they do with this now because I, I'm not sure what you said the other day that maybe the semifinals would be the time to do this. Obviously, if you do it in the quarterfinals, you have a, a greater chance for or in the last 16, I should say, you have a greater chance for th- th- these mad events to take place because you just have more games. Uh, and, and maybe keeping this the way it is next season will be the way to go because I did not see this thing working out at all before it happened. Yeah, I think it was to do with the fact that the competition was so horribly shortened and it's a bit of a mishmash at the moment, post-COVID, exactly how the tournament is going to work. And then the tournament, I think, will expand again when some of the South African teams come into it. So... Uh, it's up for grabs as a tournament and certainly at some point I think as a final it would be a good idea to have home and away in a final that might be a, a great thing to do I know that they may want to make a big deal about having a host city and turning it into a, a carnival of European rugby but actually if you have the opportunity to have two amazing games with the best two teams in Europe at the end of the season like who doesn't want that as you say the, the tension ratchets up significantly as the games go on so um, my favourite part of the whole weekend and I, I couldn't see uh, the uh, tweets that Stephen Jones had sent up because he's blocked me a couple of years ago but um, uh, one of the Montpellier uh, backroom team uh, quote tweeting Stephen Jones saying oh I guess we were actually pretty interested in uh, winning this game <laughs> Jones had been trolling him uh, complaining about how Montpellier were throwing their hat at it by putting out their second team which uh, turned out was good enough to beat Harlequins over two legs yeah uh, what, what, did, what did Jones block you for? Oh, I can't remember. Actually, you know, disagreeing with him, I think, or um, maybe laughing at some of the nonsense that he came out with. That's a, that's a disgrace if you disagreed with somebody, though. You, you deserve to be blocked for that. It might have been something I'd said about the Welsh team. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, what else is in green? We're going to finish up at Liverpool here because they were sensational for at least, you know, uh, half of football on Saturday. But I think that maybe there was a, a sense of the game being up with regards to the Manchester City fight back in the second half a little bit, certainly from the way Liverpool would have looked at it. They were just so, so good in that first half. And like I think that we've, we've spoken a lot about how Jurgen Klopp kind of picks his team over his closing period. And, and I wonder if he's actually edging towards his best team at this point. Certainly when you look at that midfield, like I saw this tweet Jack Closby from This Is Anfield said that the Fabinho, Thiago, Keita midfield has only started twice. Benfica away and City on Saturday, uh, two devastating performances and two not chaotic performances, but it, it definitely feels that there is an element of that about that midfield, that it's attack, 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 and certainly when they're on the ball, they can do some some brilliant stuff. Obviously, Fabinho holds a fort outstandingly well, but you still love him. You still love to watch him when he's on the ball as well. And Thiago and Kate, obviously, when, when they're on the ball, just absolutely exceptional. And I wonder, is that how he's going to go over the next little while? You'd love to see that midfield, for example, start against Manchester United tonight and see what would happen. Because they put up a 5-0 already this season. They've got to be thinking to themselves, how do we make this 6-7? Yeah, OK, we're going to talk about this with Mark Lawrence in just a moment, so I don't want to get too much into it, but uh, do you think the quadruple is realistic? Yes, absolutely. They're in a final, and they're in a semi-final, and they're uh, a point behind uh, the league leaders. So uh, they, I don't think it's going to happen, but it absolutely is realistic, and I, I don't think it's going to happen because I think Liverpool's running as harder than Manchester City's, and I think Manchester City will win the rest of their games. Yeah. So I, I think I think Manchester City will win the, the Premier League. I do think Liverpool will beat Chelsea in the, the FA Cup final, and I think Liverpool will certainly be in the Champions League final. And... Liverpool versus Manchester City, who are you picking in that after Saturday's evidence? And I do think Saturday does move the needle in this a little bit. I don't think it does. I think Liverpool beat them. I don't no? think it, no. You're not, you're well, not because because they've got the best goalkeeper in the world on the bench. He's not, not going to be on the bench for the Champions League final. And yeah, it has an fair. impact. You know, it's literally fair. the difference. Ed- Edison is a huge part. There's no question. No well, we, we, saw, we saw exactly the difference is uh, Edison good enough to like calmly get the ball away as it trickles over the line. His replacement, not good enough to do that and uh, bundled into the net. And you're like, well, you know, I mean, that's what you get. That's what you get for yeah, I, I, the Billy Big Bollocks. Uh, well, and hopefully, I mean, I wonder, is that the, the door ajar for them to recall their goalkeeper from loan and, and Gavin Bazzuno all of a sudden is playing FA Cup next season? Yeah, I think I'd still prefer one, one season uh, in the Championship playing week in, week out um, to get to the point where he's just as good as Edison. 
Because uh, like uh, that, that is an outcome that is on the table for us at the moment. It is 7.59 this morning. A reminder, OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Every week, we're giving away a Gillette Labs shaving kit to be in with a chance of winning. Let us know who you think should make the performance rankings. The best place to enter is the Off The Ball Instagram page. The comments box is on our story. You can give us red. You can give us uh, amber. You can give us green. Whatever you want. And we'll read out the rest of your entries across the rest of the show today. And we'll uh, be in touch with the winner after the show this morning. But that is this week's Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette. We've got Mark Lawrence up next, and you're also in the uh, ad break here, going to hear a clip about Football Saturday reacting to the sacking of Sean Dyche. It's 4-4-2. It's what you know, what you see is what you get. Like, like losing Chris Wood is probably a negative because he's a big target man for them. I went to Newcastle. Mm. Obviously, we know why he would go there and he'd relationship with Eddie Howe. It hasn't made that many changes. Brought Veghorst in. It's hard. It's hard to stay in the Premier League, as you say, with those levels of resources and the best run they've had as a club since the 1960s. And I think with these clubs, all these clubs disappear. They, they go down the championship, but they don't come mm. back. It's. I, I think I may get yeah, it. Unless they come back in their first season. Yeah, that's yeah, the, that's yeah. the sort of the and caveat. Sh- and Sean yeah. Dyche was the person who yeah, did that. So yeah. you can make it. Um, all of the bottom six teams have basically changed their manager now this season. And um, I it's think ten teams in the Premier League have, haven't mm. they? Or something. It's, uh, something like that. it's wrong that like you sh- you sh- it's wrong that you should be able to almost make that decision at this stage from an abs- about an absolute club legend. Um, I thought to be Elsa won. I thought that was kind of reasonable enough, and that he like did great time for him, but they were really, really they were, tanked. Nah, they were, they were and he was kind of goals like he was kind of half on the way out anyway. I yeah, think so. Yeah, I could yeah. see that some of them, I think, are just like well, like, if you if you brought in the manager, it's your fault more so than the manager himself. And like Sean Dyche, I don't know. I I I I hope they go down now. To be honest, well, they are. I think they are going down. I, I would say now with mm. uh, with Watford and Norwich. Um, interesting. Will you get another club? Because you could see Extremely I could see good uh, reputation. Uh, like. Sean Dyche in well, Everton or a yeah. Leeds. You could see him in those types of positions absolutely OTB AM this is OTB Sports Radio marginal gains XG top speed recovery what's it all about want to improve but don't know where to start with more data than ever now available OTB Sports have teamed up with Whoop to cut through the noise and help you raise your game no matter the sport OTB Sports are delivering the metrics that matter Meaningful Metrics, in partnership with Whoop, the personalized digital fitness and health coach that helps you unlock your inner potential. See Whoop.com for more. Follow OTB Sports social channels for the best insights and stats this season. FBD Insurance knows this sound spells trouble for van drivers. But if you're an existing FBD customer, you'll get 15% off a new van insurance policy. It's how we're keeping you and your van on the road. Visit fbd.ie or contact your local branch. FBD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. Terms and conditions apply. 15% discount available on new commercial motor policies only when an existing FBD farm, business, car or home policy is in place. FBD Insurance Group Limited, trading as FBD Insurance, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Commercial motor insurance is underwritten by FBD Insurance PLC. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, three minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM, and we're talking football with Mark Lawrence. And Mark, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm all good. Thanks, chaps. I have a slight concern if I'm a Liverpool fan that perhaps tonight is a bit of a trap game for us where we've already hammered Man United this year. We're coming off the back of a massive win against our main rivals. Everybody's talking about four trophies. And it's still Man United, and it's still one of those yeah. games where it's like, do we just? I'm not saying they're going to get complacent, but this happens. Strange things happen in football where Man United dig a performance out on muscle memory, if nothing else. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm absolutely totally with you. I'm going to match as well, so I'm, I'm a bit that way. Which is, you know, they really won't need a team talk, Man United, will they? Um, getting done five at home by Liverpool. And the way Liverpool are at the moment as well, and the way Manchester United are in a, a mess, basically. So you would think within the starting eleven squad, whatever you want to call it, there will be a lot of resilience and resistance, and there'll be a little bit like, let's get stuck into this lot and let's see if they can deal with a little bit of um, tackling, shall we say, for want of a better description. I mean, they, they can't they can't come to Anfield and be passive, surely, because if they are, they'll get they'll get rolled over again. 
And the physicality that Ralph Ranić has bemoaned, the lack of from Manchester United's perspective, isn't really there in the team. So, like I can see, you, you try and pick a fight with somebody who's bigger than you, and you hope that they overreact <coughs> somehow. Like it yeah. doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And I understand the Liverpool fans out there and the Man United fans are going to be like, "This is nonsense." Like you know, this could easily be. We've already had somebody text us this morning saying Liverpool should be looking for seven or eight tonight. And no, well, wow. I mean that's just it's just that's ridiculous, isn't it? And I mean, look. If you ask Jurgen Klopp now, he'd take one nil, one one nil, no injuries, move on, um, and that's the way that's the way to approach it. The other thing as well is is, you know, obviously a good result at the weekend. Um, although I thought City really played into Liverpool's hands, so he will change the team a, a, around again tonight. I would have thought make two or three changes, um, and just you know, business as usual. Basically, I think that's. I can't believe he's given them long, long team talks anymore because they know exactly what they need to do. What changes would you make to the team tonight? I don't think he'll start Cater. I think I think Henderson comes back in. Um, legs, basically, energy, um, driving from midfield, all, all, all those kind of things. Cater had a really good game at the weekend. He's, he's you know, he can't, unfortunately, he can't mm-hmm. kind of string four or five really good games Together, that's been his problem. And then, of course, he gets injuries and stuff and he seems to be out for quite a long time, So, which is unfortunate for him. But as I say, he was really good on Saturday. But I think Henderson comes back in and he might he might change one of the front players, possibly. Well, what does Kate need to do then to get ahead of, of Jordan Henderson? Is, is it just that to, to prove to people that he can go 10, 15 games in the bounce? Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know that you know there's a player in there. I think you know. I think Klopp's always said that there's a player in there, and he keeps playing him, thinking that you know he's, he's just going to have this run where suddenly Liverpool realised you know the ability of the player that they signed up all those years ago. But he's he's just one of those who's just been really, really unfortunate. He's never he's never really had a consistent run in in the team, and you know he's got in and then maybe not played particularly well, or then he's got injured. He's he's actually been really, really unlucky. Um, but obviously, you know, he, he gets bypassed probably at the moment because Klopp thinks that he's got other players who are eight, nine out of ten where, you know, Cater might be six one game and, and eight the next week, which at, at that level you can't have. Well, and what about the stylistically then between Keita and Henderson? Is is there a different sort of game, even if you could trust them yeah. both the same? Like, you know, you've got Everton, for example, again, that they'd be expected to win at the weekend, and then Champions League, then the following midweek. So is there a consistency there to the selection in, in your view, or is it a little bit of a horses for courses situation? I I, I think Klopp's preferred three is, is Henderson, Fabinho, obviously, and, and Thiago. Um, I mean... You know, I worship at the feet of Thiago. I just think he's brilliant. It's just as I keep going on to you every time I come on the program, um, and he's he's going through a run where obviously he's getting even fitter. He just sees stuff all the time, and that's why I don't, that's why I don't think Kato will, will will get in. To be honest with you, it's it's probably I think the best midfield is the three that would start tonight. I think, but you never know. A club he might suddenly decide no, Kato played well at the weekend. I'll chuck him in again, but. I doubt it somehow. The Thiago performance seemed to be better this time against City than the first time, which is actually a really good sign. I don't know if you agree, first off, that he was better at the weekend than he was when in the two-all draw. But it's the sign of a yeah. player who's actually uh, assessing the scenario, learning as the season goes on and um, understanding what you have to do to impose your game. Yeah. I mean, he's just, he's just he's just like a fabulous talent, and occasionally he has an off game, which doesn't everybody. But he sees stuff that none of the other midfield players see at all. And you know, as I keep, he's got radar. He's like even in the game at, at the Etihad. I mean, was it was it his diagonal pass that started off the move? That was it the first equaliser, I think. You know, a hell of a pass and stuff. But he, what he, what he will do, he's not, he's not worried about giving the ball away, which sounds daft. But he isn't because, because you know, he'll, he'll, he'll try basically. If you watch a lot of Premier League football at the midfield players, second touch is backwards or sideways. Really seriously, as if you watch it, it's. But it is not with him. It's just everything's forward, and that's you know, he makes them really, really more progressive as a team. With his ability, just to, just to, some of the balls he plays in as well. I'm sure if you get a straw poll with the uh, 
the forward players about him passing and into feet, they'll all like wow. Because and he and he really he really drills the ball into them, and it's easier for top players to control them with their touch, etc. And um, I just rave about him, as you know. But he's just he's, he's made such such a difference because he just. He just sees things. He just sees opportunities and passes that mere mortals don't see at all. Is there any possibility they take him out of the starting lineup tonight to rest him for the other big games coming? That he's well, the one. I would. I would rather play him tonight than then. If that was the case, then play him against uh, Everton, because Everton's just going to be a, a dogfight. Um, and unless Liverpool, you know, get get up early and get a couple of goals lead, it's, it's going to be an absolute dogfight. And um, they're horrible games to play, and as everybody knows. And I think tonight will be less of a dogfight, to be honest with you. And, and that's why I think he would play, him, but maybe leave him out against Everton. I guess that makes sense from a, a physical perspective as well. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. just the, the last one on the the, um, the defence, right? So Kanade comes into the team and scores every game he plays at the moment, uh, which is pretty good. It's a, a real sign again that they're they're managing the introduction of a new player into the team where there's no pressure yeah. and there's no stress and it's like the complete opposite of last season when all the centre-backs seem to be fit all the time which is a bit of a miracle but do you, is he getting to the point where you have to pick him or not yet no not yet um, because you only had to see against Benfica the other night where um, he doesn't quite get at the moment that the high line you know you can only you can only really I mean that's how Liverpool play but you can only really play with a high line if there's no pressure on the if there's if there's pressure on the passer from midfield. If there isn't, you've got you've got to drop off a little bit. I don't think he's quite got that yet. Look, he's he's, he's almost there. But um, does he get in before Matip? No, no. Um, Matip's Matip's been excellent again all season. And the other thing that Matip has been giving Liverpool as well is is coming out from the back and and committing the opposition midfield players and it's, it's made such a difference and uh, him and him and Van Dijk obviously are the best partnership at the club so Kanate is getting closer yeah shall we say which is which is fab isn't it and he look he looks like he's learning and I mean what is he 22, 23? he's a beast as well isn't he in terms of size uh, one last thing then Salah uh, he's playing really well. The ball just won't go in off his ass. It's whatever is going on. <laughs> it's just bad luck at the moment, it seems. Or, or is he playing yeah. a little bit off? I don't know. What's your? No, he's, no. It's, there's not. There's nothing wrong with his performances. He's just. He's just not scoring. But the winning, and it, 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 it really doesn't matter. And it, it will change. It always will. It always has done. I mean, Mane had a little bit of a spell as well. But you know, the fact they've got, they've got five players in there for the three positions. Is, is not an issue and as I said they're, they're winning all the games and generally they're, they're winning quite comfortably and I know Klopp said on, on Saturday that the first half was the best performance but in all honesty I thought they were aided and abetted by uh, Manchester City because why you wouldn't play your best goalkeeper and arguably one of the best goalkeepers in the world in a team that was weakened because of injuries elsewhere just remains to be seen I just think you know, I said to you before about Guardiola, I think sometimes he overthinks everything and thinks he's the cleverest person in, in the room. But um, what a strange decision that was, playing the goal, playing the American boy. Yeah, I, and look, the the goal that Zach Steffen concedes um, by his touch, when you compare and contrast with what Ederson was able to do in a similar scenario, like you can see that the difference between at least getting into extra time in the game is that one goal. And well, we, we reduce football sometimes too easily to these tiny incidents but like it's it's clear that in a similar scenario one of the best goalkeepers in the world has actually shown us in the previous game that he can get out of yeah. that scenario and this guy is just young and learning his way and getting to the inexperienced maybe rather than young um, can't do it no well you know I thought I should have saved the third goal I thought his, I thought his positioning was wrong I mean it, it was shot away it was shot away by that poor lad I mean um be interesting to see whether we ever we ever see him again playing for City in a in a, in a meaningful game and um, you know and, and it's, it's unfortunate obviously but what 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 a game to throw him in on it just it just did not make any sense and I, and I know after uh, the game in Atletico Madrid when I think what did Guardiola say we're in trouble well no wonder he's in trouble when he chucked the kid in I mean what. Well, what, what's the point? I don't, I don't get it. I really seriously do not get it. You could have actually completely done his career in. Uh, the 
Daily Mail this morning are reporting that Manchester City have agreed terms with uh, Haaland's people. Half a million a week mm. is going to be the, the salary and that that will result in them triggering the release clause for 60 million or whatever the, whatever the fee ends up being. Yeah. So uh, is it a coincidence that this comes in the immediate aftermath of defeat to their main rivals in the Cup? Um, is it a bone that they're throwing to the City fans going, don't worry? No. No, I think it was always going to happen, wasn't it? I don't, I don't, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was, it, it was that. It's just, um, you know, he's only just come back from injury, but he had a spell of not scoring for a while as well, didn't he? I think everyone was looking at him thinking, wow, is, has, has his magic gone? But no, I mean, it'd be an outstanding signing. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And it won't really matter if, if he's not, because they're still an absolute top team. Well, you know, these 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 two, Liverpool and Man City, the, the two top teams in the world, as everybody knows now. So um, I think I think it'd be a good signing um, and gives them, again, a different way of playing. But if, if you look at, he's going to have to get used to the fact that sometimes he might not see the ball for a while because they do love keeping it. And it might suit him. It might suit him to have a little bit of a rest, you know, up up front, and then when it gets into his areas, possibly that all of a sudden he's raring to go. But I think I think I think it's a really good signing, and they're always going to make a statement with the signings anyway. Look at Grealish for 100 million quid last year. Do you make City still the favourites to win the league? Yeah, yeah, I'd rather be in their position than Liverpool, although. You know, as I said to you before, it's 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 easier chasing and it's more difficult being chased. But but, but yeah, but you just the the only thing is you just I just look at Guardiola and look at his, and he's a top coach, manager, call him whatever you will. But he does sometimes make strange decisions. I'll throw you another one in, which wasn't long ago. Crystal Palace away um, when they were drawing needed to change the game. No substitutions. What's what's that all about? I, I just I, I just that's I think is kind of Achilles' heel for want of a better description. And I'm just wondering whether in this running he has another one. That's the hope from a Liverpool perspective. Uh, yeah, yeah. If they were <laughs> if they were to pull this off, right? The the quadruple. I, I I do wonder first off what what's your instinct about the fact that that's what they keep getting asked about, and it keeps being every paper every day has had talk of the quadruple since the league cup final does mm-hmm. that does that add pressure does it what, what does that have any impact do you think on the possibility of nah. this happening no nah, they're in a bubble they're they're in a bubble and you know they know i mean the clock keeps saying as well and the, the number of games they've got to play um and obviously still in two cup competitions because you know you just need one poor performance in a in a cup match and, and you're out um no they won't Listen, they won't be talking about that in the dressing room. They'll actually be taking the mickey out of each other and, and stuff with, with with different things. That that won't be. Come on, boys, let's you know go on and win the quadruple. It, it will not. It will not be mentioned. Um, you know, we were looking fortunate to win three. I think one year, three out of four and stuff. And he didn't actually until the very last competition, like the European Cup. He didn't think, oh, you know, we can win a tr- we can win a treble. It was. You're more worried about the fact who were you playing next? Would you still be in the team? You know, if you had a bit of a stumer and stuff. So, no, it's it's. And the other thing, I think these guys don't read papers anymore, do they? Um, they, they obviously watch telly and listen to the radio. But well, maybe maybe not even listen to the radio, unfortunately. But that's their own fault. But um, they probably watch Sky and you know realize how great they are. Not, but now <laughs> it's. Um, in, in in the dressing room, it, it will be the last thing that anybody ever mentions. Because, by the way, if Klopp heard it, Klopp would go nuts. It, like it, it, it is like an unquestionable, massive achievement if you manage to win multiple trophies, whether it's a quadruple or a treble. And not to bring it back to Pep again, but it does, like that was what was on the line for Manchester City on Saturday. Like um, with his team selection, it was mm. the ability to go. And uh, I guess match Manchester United's treble, the exact treble that, that that they had notched up. And they were they were in prime position to win the Premier League. They would obviously be in prime position had they won on Saturday. And they would feel that they could definitely do a job in the Champions League. So so that just makes mm-hmm. the team selection a little bit more mysterious. Yeah. Well, it, well, it does. But then, um, I don't, I mean, I, you know, we don't know what's, what's his, what he's thinking doing between his ears. So, you know, as I say, he's an, he's an outstanding coach, but he just, I don't think he would have been I don't think the treble particularly worries him. I think he said, didn't he, about 
a month or six weeks ago that the Champions League is a trophy that they really want to win. And I think if, if you said to Liverpool, what would you like to win? Um, they'd probably say the league, <laughs> you know, between between the two of them. But you can't, you cannot pick what you want to win, can you? Because obviously you've got to be outstanding teams along the way and, and you can lose games and, and stuff like that. So, um, no, I think, I think all the noise outside about trebles and quadruples and all those kind of things, ah, I don't, in, inside that dressing room, I'm, I wouldn't say it's banned because then you're drawing attention to the fact that you're banning talk about it. But as I said, I, I, Klopp will be having absolutely none of that whatsoever. All right, Mark, we've got to let you go. Thanks a billion. You've been great with your time this morning. Pleasure. Cheers. Enjoy the game tonight. Thank you. That's uh, Mark Lawrence and helping us to preview Liverpool against Manchester United tonight. What do you think is going to happen, Owen? I think Liverpool will win 2 0. And I think that they're uh, like substantially ahead of Manchester United. Well, they of are course, strange things have happened. Yeah, and uh, you're not, you're not, you're. There's no weird like Southampton beat Arsenal at the weekend. Brighton beat Spurs. You're saying none of that, none of that crap can happen. Norwich were, you know, like two 0 down, came back to two all, could have like easily done something against Man United at the weekend. You're saying no, I think no, no, no. I, I think that the way Jurgen Klopp has been playing or speaking in the last couple of days, I think that there is, I think there's limited chance of that happening. Like he's really gone to to, to ten with his uh, talking up of Manchester United and how big uh, a game it is. He says that like we have to be angry, we have to be greedy, uh, you have to approach this game like you've won nothing. I think that probably illustrates the attitude of a team that uh, challenges for a title anyway and Manchester United don't, don't have that like this, this is obviously the night where Manchester United get angry and get greedy like they don't do this on a week to week basis so that's why you'd be a little bit concerned of a, of a shock of Liverpool is because of what Manchester United can bring but Liverpool letting down their end of the bargain that's not going to happen because that would be completely out of character for what we've seen from them this season and over the last couple of years yeah it, it, it just the, like for them to be perfect all the way through to the end of the season would be remarkable. Would be like we we appreciate the fact that we are talking about one of the all time great teams if they manage to pull that off and that that is right there for them, and they're trending towards being one of the all time great teams, but they haven't actually delivered enough silverware just yet. They've won a Champions League and they've won a league, and a League Cup, which you know we 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 count for the purposes of a quadruple. But when you're tallying it up at the moment, they're. Uh, they're as good as any of the Premier League era teams except the treble winning team except maybe the Invincibles except maybe the Chelsea team who won two leagues in Mourinho's first period like at the moment you know they've won they need to win more I, I would say to deliver on the promise that they show at the moment is that and have I uh, been ambivalent enough about that and given everybody enough to agree with that I think that this team and its quality deserves more trophies, but deserve got nothing to do with it uh, when it comes to the, <laughs> to deliver that punchline of it, just which I created for myself and not out of the park myself. Uh, so, like, uh, yes, they, they're 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 too talented to have just walked away from this era with just those three trophies for sure. Uh, the problem is they're up against a team that is better than a team that the treble Manchester United teams were up against domestically. And I would say the same goes for the Invincibles team. That's from a movie that was out before you were born. I know. I know. I, you know what? I, I realise and I've come to the, the realisation that life does exist before 1994. But I'm, I'm not entirely, I don't, like, I kind of like stick my finger in the air and kind of realise that, 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 that there is kind of life. And there is culture. And uh, you're a man of culture when it comes to like 1980s and 1970s. 1990, 1992. Unforgiven. That's the movie. Yeah. You, you knew that though, right? Well, of course. I mean, uh, like it's uh, Gene Hackman, Clint Eastwood. Yeah, Gene Hackman is literally getting his head blown off. The next thing that happens after deserves got nothing to do with it. <laughs> William there you go. blows the head off Gene yeah. Hackman's character. His name, I've, I've, I've uh, sure, I'd, I'd say now if we were to sit here for twenty minutes, I'd be able to work it out, but I can't. But yeah, that's okay. the point. We can just sit here in silence and just wait for it to come to you. Deserves got nothing to do with it, and you get your head blown off sometimes by Man United, like. <laughs> if, if if Ralph Rangnick was to win tonight and secure fourth place and stop Liverpool from winning the league, he would go down as like in he would become a cult hero immediately. So there's a lot on the line from a Manchester United's mm. perspective, which we haven't spoken about. It's all been Liverpool. Liverpool won at the weekend. It's the quadruple. If Manchester United were to be able to somehow derail the unstoppable juggernaut of Liverpool from winning the league, and you listen to Lauro, the Champions League would be great. But like we've just won that. 
Whereas actually winning the league in front of our own fans is the thing that the city of Liverpool, apart from the Everton half of it, wants more than anything. If they could stop that, Manchester United could be the ones to stop that. If Ralph Rania could achieve that, that would be uh, that's like that's a legacy, right? That's something. Like he's definitely fighting for his own credibility as much as anything else. I, I would say I think that that's taken a massive battering over the last few months. They, like, uh, and we've had this conversation around Ten Hag over the last little while as well. That there is a risk that you just get on this water slide, which uh, is your reputation, and there's nothing you can do about it, and you're just constantly slipping away. And that's what's happened to Ranieri here a little bit this season. But there's time. There is time, as we said at the top of the show. They can get top four here. They're absolutely in the conversation for it. If he manages to pull that off, it would be a saving. He would have climbed back up that water slide, which nobody's ever done before, and he would have saved his reputation and maybe even enhanced it. Yeah, I think there'd be a, a bit of enhancing going on at the at the end where everybody revises the, oh, look at the shit show he inherited. That team should have finished ninth. And then he finishes fourth. Now, obviously, they, have to, they would have to do something remarkable tonight uh, for that to happen. So the uh, other alternative that they finish out of the Champions League places and out of European places is still on the table for them. Um, Lil Bill, that was his name. Lil Bill, Lil Bill. Uh, Little Bill Daggett was um, the Gene Hackman character um, who you should think of tonight if, uh, if Bruno Fernandes manages to ping one in from 45 yards. Bruno's in all the papers today for having crashed his Porsche and having had to get Juan Mata to come and pick him up. Juan Mata being in the role of the person that you ring when you crash your car on the way to training is not that surprising really. It's like, listen, uh, that owner, uh, it's been a bit of a bit of an issue here. Uh, I'll tell you about it when you get here. Could you come and just pick me I'm gonna I'm going to drop a pin on WhatsApp. Could you just drive here? And don't tell anybody about it. Certainly, don't tell any photographers who also happen to be on the scene capturing my very expensive car and the damage to the front right fender. Yeah, it, like a very, very on brand for Juan Mata. You know that you could also like crack a joke after about 10 minutes in the car as well with Juan Mata. Or he, sorry, he would do that thing as well. He would kind of soften the blow a little bit for that. There, and there isn't even anybody that comes close to that in, in that dressing room. What was the, what was the line that Dara Shea had about Eamon Fitzmaurice? If I murdered somebody, he'd be the first person I call. Was that it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's and Juan Mata is in the aim of the role for everybody in that Manchester United dressing room. Uh, OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. It is 8.26 this morning. Some of your comments that have been rolling in on YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, John says, isn't the orange twirl exactly like Kerry's chocolate orange chocolate? No. Touche. No. Oh. No. They're oh. different. They're different. Cadbury's chocolate is different from Terry's chocolate. Yeah, but it's orange. Orange just like kind of like blasts you with something that just takes away the idea of there being different brands. I would say that there's like uh, more of a hint of orange in the twirl. The Terry's chocolate orange is a bang over the head. Both are pleasurable. Both deliver the same thing. You're, you, know, you get to the end and you're like, I am pleasured. That's like exactly what you want from uh, eating too much chocolate. Uh, the orange chocolate lint is a real thing of beauty says Lawrence I mean if there was a hierarchy of um, stuff that you want for future reference out there if anybody's watching I would like some lint uh, the lint chocolate is my favourite at Christmas at for, uh, Easter did you like did you go shopping for your own Easter egg on like Easter morning when you realised that pretty much had thought pretty of you? much it was like late on Saturday I was like I'm really not getting you really I'm really not getting anything no okay fair enough the worst you weren't here last week but the worst part is like I sent away for this fancy thing online um, and then it arrived and it turned out it was actually the size of a cream egg <laughs> it's like, oh no what yeah, was that it was like uh, that that uh, easter egg is far away oh no it's right beside <laughs> me and it's still the same size um, <laughs> it was like a fancy filled painted thing which was like you know I was saying um, roughly cost the same as a Fabergé egg uh, I was like, oh, this is going to win me some brownie points. I might even get a, an egg in return. No, no egg in return. Oh, it was a gift? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, not for myself. Oh. No, I didn't buy it. I know. I didn't buy the fancy stuff for myself. That was, uh, yeah. And how, how, much did you, how much did you pay for it, if you don't mind me asking? For a green egg? 20 quid. <laughs> like, 20 quid is going to be like a normal sized egg. It was literally, but it was like smaller than it. It was half a cream egg. Um... Oh Apparently it was very nice too. I didn't. I didn't get tried. No, I can imagine you didn't. No. That's, they need to start putting like uh, ten cents beside Easter eggs. There wasn't enough to share. Uh, it's eight twenty-eight this morning. Um, Klopp admitted Liverpool took mercy on them at Old Trafford at five 0 after Pogba got sent off. Says Yassin with half an hour to go, they could feasibly hit them for six plus tonight. 
this is, uh, you know, that, that's the type of stuff that creeps in. What, what are all the friends of the Liverpool players saying ahead of this game tonight? In their WhatsApp groups, in their meetings with them, are they like, oh, you're going to go and hammer Man United, it's going to be a historic night for you. All you got to do is show up, they'll barely be able to keep the ball kicked out and so forth and so on, right? That's, that's what they're all saying. None of them are saying, I'm yeah. really worried about this Man United team, this flaky United team. None of them are saying that. No, but like Liverpool haven't gotten to within contention on four fronts by allowing that stuff to seep into their heads. Like that, that's not even going to be something that they entertain. Like Liverpool are better than Manchester United, and if Liverpool show up, they will beat them. And of course, there are other factors than how hard you're trying. But I don't think there will be enough of those factors that will stop Liverpool showing up to the extent required to beat Manchester United. And that, that's that's why you'd be confident enough. Like, obviously, the 6-7 thing could be ridiculous. Like, the, the, the thing is, though, that Manchester United, if they concede an early goal, what happens to them? What, what are their friends saying in the WhatsApp group? They're going, oh, this could get ugly if there's an early goal. And that's the difference. Uh, I'm looking forward to a Maguire masterclass tonight, says Ballon Dorson, uh, also on YouTube, which is a fair point. There are some extenuating circumstances which prevent this from being a true trap game in that Manchester United are uh, discernibly and demonstrably a bad team um, so uh, MOC says that wouldn't be like you George say something about Wales very out of character indeed I've no idea why Stephen Jones blocked me if anybody uh, wants to ask Stephen Jones what it was that although he's blocked so many people at this point I suspect he can't actually remember why he blocked people uh, Shifty Lad says I'm not a Liverpool fan but I think Salah really needs Firmino to play for him to be at his best Trent is amazing his pass on the third goal is pure class beware Manchester United tonight come on the devils um, does Salah need some Firmino action beside him I think it's just bad luck rather than anything specific it's not like we don't we don't believe any of the conspiracy theories about the contract playing in his mind and the absence of certainty somehow feeding into an uncertainty when it comes to him being a smidgen less ruthless or less fortunate when it comes to his finishes, right? Do we? No, like I, I, I wonder is there questions maybe about just the um, severity of the damage he was doing to opponents in the first half of the season with uh, with his goal scoring. Uh, like I, I don't think anybody said that there's been a, a massive drop off whatsoever, but he has played a lot of football. He has gone and he's gone on a couple of international breaks that have been particularly taxing. And uh, like and, and and I would suggest that, that maybe that's had a, a tiny bit of an impact, but but nothing major. Like I think that Mo Salah's still the best player in the Premier League, one of the best players in the world right now, and he's the guy you want with the ball at his feet if it's nil all going down the home stretch in the Champions League final. Uh, Liverpool up against one good team domestically says in Bod We Trust 13 on YouTube who isn't actually Brian O'Driscoll uh, Liverpool up against one good team domestically that same team in Europe United's travel team had to contend with a great Arsenal team domestically and then Barcelona Inter Milan Juventus and Bayern when they were all real forces in Europe you'd say that uh, Bayern were still a real force in Europe you know I mean they've just been beaten in the uh, quarterfinals but let's wait and see exactly you know how good Villarreal are over two legs you would also say that Real Madrid are still a good team in European football terms Chelsea just won the European Cup last season I, I think this argument that like uh, oh this era is much easier than other eras isn't true is it? I, I would say that when you get to the to the very end of the Champions League it's 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 actually more difficult than it used to be. I think the, the super team era is here in a way that it wasn't in 99. I do think that maybe getting out of your group would have been tougher in 99. I think Manchester United's group proved that it was it, it, like the, the group they had, they'd had in 99. That was obviously a bit more coincidental, but I think that there was a, definitely a few more banana skins around the way. Whereas at the moment, I think that it's just the top teams that are all on a crazy level and, and a level that perhaps we haven't seen before. So it's when you get to the, to the quarterfinals, semifinals, finals, ironic that Liverpool are playing Villarreal, I'd accept. But that's where the, the problems arise and that's when the, the real difference is, I think. All right, last quick messages here. Uh, Owen, excited for the upcoming Kendrick album? Yes, yes, it's not till next month. Uh, obviously, uh, I got a lot of hate for saying that Kendrick existed in a different plane to Eminem after the Super Bowl this year. But you know what? If there's Kendrick fans out there, hopefully there might be a bit of love as well. It's been five years, five long years since uh, one of the best to ever do it has done it. So uh, next May, I can't remember the exact date, he released the press release last night. Uh, quote tweeting somebody who says Kendrick's retired, I think. Uh, so this is going to be his last album with his current recording label. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what happens after that. 
Okay. Uh, did he not come off as absolute peak, though? Was it on a period where everybody was like, oh, he's past it? This is a comeback in some ways? I mean, obviously, five years since, uh, that would make sense too, but... Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I would respectfully disagree with that, but I'm I'm not necessarily a rap aficionado. I just think that Kendrick is absolutely phenomenal. And as I say, one of the best to ever do it. And I think his last album was absolutely on that level. Not my personal favourite, but he, he hasn't necessarily dropped off a, a whole a whole pile. It's going to be one of the music events of the year uh, next month. All right. Uh, Michael says, I'm a United fan. I've never felt less hopeful about his future before. Our midfield is non-existent. All I needed, two midfielders and the club signed Ronaldo. Instead, it's a disaster. And Martin says, I'd love to see Randy take a leap of faith and play a lot of youngsters in reserves tonight. That would be uh, an amazing <laughs> power flex from Randy going, ah, screw you, you screw me, I'm screwing you. No fourth you, lads. Oh, that's going to be the Conference League next year for them, isn't it? Week yeah. in, week out, we get to see the academy. Yeah, 100%. OTBM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish your day. It's time for the newspapers. There are so many idiots out there, so many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What should be a spoofer? He says bullshit. Ah, no, I haven't. Come on, don't, don't be. No, I'm not. Yes. No. Okay. Uh, otbsports.com Ralph Arnick issues positive injury update on Bruno Fernandes he's going to be alright Lord Lariat claims 150th Irish Grand National we'll talk about that a bit more in a few minutes but a sensational back to back for an unheralded trainer winning the richest race in Irish jumps racing on Bank Holiday uh, and it was it's his local track and last year um, when they had 151 150 to one winner there was nobody at the track so this year obviously a huge and incredible scenes for it Bruno Fernandes involved in car accident but believed to have escaped serious injury he's grand and Man City aren't too concerned about the FA Cup says Keith Tracy obviously not to the point where they were picking their best team the Irish Independent Keane I'll never be a manager again I can't see a club giving me a real good opportunity to get back into it that's Roy Keane in an interview that he was doing with uh, Jamie Carragher um Kernanbach's disciplinary stance over players joining Malise. That's Joe Kernan saying anybody else joining in needs to be suspended too. And the URC urged to contemplate final in South Africa. So it's possible that uh, helping to bet in the South African teams, there will be a home final for our South African team if they make it to the final. Uh, Leinster are in South Africa with um, an interesting squad to see exactly what's going to happen. Uh, how they get on there and Lord Leaping as O'Hanlon soars to national success so Lightning struck twice in the Irish Grand National as Dermot McLaughlin landed the Ferry House Shopee so 41 chance this year 151 chance last year and um, a uh, a young jockey who had previously tried to make it as a flat jockey and has come back and still riding out his claim um, a sensational story uh, to win the race yesterday it's like I mean it's incredible to be able to do it once as Sensational to be able to do it twice is absolutely remarkable. So, uh, back page of the Herald: No mo goals is not a problem. Klopp happy with form of Salah and Mane ahead of clash with Man United. Uh, continuation of foul play produces yet another shocking advertisement for rugby. This is Owen Doyle's opinion piece in the Irish uh, Times. Carberry and Munster look to build on confidence boosting win. So, uh, Joey Carberry's kicking style, Owen. Tell me how happy you feel watching it. What, what are the feelings that? And you're just watching him as if he's out in his back garden chipping balls over. Pretty great, I would have thought. What's the sorry? What's the angle here? I actually haven't read this piece. What's the? Oh no, I'm just saying. The, what, I don't know if you. I don't know if caught the game live at the weekend, but like, yeah, there was one bit where uh, they kept telling us about how the howling gales and winds were blowing from, and uh, like, there's a kicking from tee. the Shannon. There's a uh, yeah. There's a kicking tee, and Keith Earls is lying there holding the ball in the kicking tee. And it's like, no, no big deal, no bother. And then there's another one from the sideline after the incredible, the, I, I, had, I stopped and, and rewound and rewound and rewound and rewound to try and see, how did Zebo get the ball to Diolande? How did he do it? And then I think it's um, Brendan Moran from Sportsfile. I don't know if you've seen the, the range of pictures that he has. Have you seen those? These stills? Yeah. That, they are unbelievable. That's like some of the best sports photography you're ever going to see, where you can see that Zebo's not looking and he's got the ball is still in his hand as he throws it backwards to Dialende. I couldn't see on the TV how he got the ball to him. It was sensational. And then Dialende, absolutely perfectly, does the, oh, I'm just going to jump in because it's going to look great for the cameras. And I don't really need to do this, but I look absolutely, he, he does the full Superman uh, 
touching the ball down with two hands. It's delicious. It's absolutely one of the most mm. delicious things you're ever going to see. And then the kick is impossible because of the wind, blah, blah, blah. But it's not impossible because it's Joey Carberry. And it's like, wow, look at this. So. Like, that, I, maybe that's gone a little bit underappreciated with Carberry over the last little while because from open play, he's so good. And it's like, this is a number 10 with a difference. And the very basic art of kicking the ball between the posts and how effective he is at it and how good he looks doing it is something maybe that hasn't gone commented upon as much as maybe it should have done because he is very, very... Like, even, even the night against even the night against Leinster, uh, when Munster looked really bad, off the tee, you're like, OK, this guy looks really good, even though his opposite number is clearly somebody who's going to be breathing down his neck for the next few years, even in the post sexton era in, in Ross Byrne. Like, and that's going to be what he's going to be judged against. The, the top quality kicker is the basic outhaves uh, around the country and he can absolutely nail those kicks when he needs to that offload from Zebo was absolutely ridiculous though and even in the replay it was hard to spot what actually happened and I'm still not sure quite what happened but um, like it, it's, it's just and I know Owen Farrell had a similar offload over the course of the weekend as well those moments where you're like how does that person do it I can't even identify on the television replay how he did it it's just magic no, the, the TV uh, cameras didn't capture a, at all. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Mail, Ronaldo tragedy, United striker in greatest pain that any parent can feel after death of newborn son. Manchester United last night offered their unconditional support to Cristiano Ronaldo after the tragic death of his baby son. The 37-year-old said he and girlfriend Georgina Rodriguez were in the greatest pain any parents can feel. He'd been expecting twins with Rodriguez and announced that the baby girl had been delivered safely. Uh, so it's a horrible story there. And then the 500 grand a week Haaland agrees deal with City. That is the Mike Keegan exclusive, which has now been picked up by everybody else. So obviously everybody else is uh, happy with the reporting that's going on. And it does look as if uh, Haaland's people have at least said this is what we will accept. So I don't think that that rules out the possibility of Real Madrid and Paris Saint-Germain joining uh, and agreeing to the same deal which then will mean that this saga continues. Uh, the mirror, uh, your pain is our pain. That's the Cristiano Ronaldo story there as well. Good Lord, 40 to 1, Lariat delivers, Lord Lariat delivers, trainer Dermot, his second Irish Grand National in a row. It's Emma Radu Kane, so she showed up to training in a Spurs top. She's a fan, apparently. Copycats is the back page of The Sun. Ralph Follow Klopp model, boss fears for United rebuild. And Frank Warren is saying that Daniel Kinahan is not involved in the Tyson Fury Dillian White fight, which is uh, taking place next weekend. And uh, it's just a, a story that continues to be in the papers every single day. Anger management Klopp wants his troops fired up for the most important points ever, ever, ever. Um, and then that's the front of the examiner. It's the last one for now. Lord and Master. Double national delight for Dermot McLaughlin as 40 to 1 outsider delivers uh, an incredible story. Um, a proper rags to riches tale from the world of horse racing. Uh, oh, one last thing, sorry. Wayne Rooney in the back of the uh, Derby got relegated officially yesterday after a fairly heroic battle from their points deduction. And he's saying he's going to bring them back up, that he's going to stick around. Which, if he does, would be one of the best football stories that I've seen in a long time where... Wayne Rooney's got his eyes on the long-term prize and uh, if he manages to get Derby up from League One to the Championship next season when the takeover happens it's dependent on the takeover happening and all that kind of stuff too so we'll see uh, Right Gary says Unforgiven a modern Western classic great cameo by Richard Harris as Cockney English Bob acting heavyweights abound in that movie Yeah uh, Richard Harris is sensational I don't, You've obviously seen this Owen I have. You seem surprised that I have seen a movie that was released before my date of birth, which I guess you know is is your is your patronising want. Well, uh, just that you're generally a cultural wasteland, and I'm impressed that you're taking efforts to recu recuperate that part of your brain, which is obviously you know lying dusty. Yeah, you see yourself and John have given me a, a kick in this direction. Um, yourself and John should do like an 80s film club, actually. It's 8.43 this morning here on OTBIM, brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Will O'Callaghan is with us. Will, good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, lads. Unforgiven didn't come out in the 1980s for a start. No, 92. Um, 92, yeah, yeah we yeah. established that earlier. Yeah. Mm. The, the ultimate anti-Western in many ways, but yeah. You, you're a fan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Unforgiven's a cracker. It's one of those kind of Clint Eastwood, you can almost like track from the start of his career where he's in traditional Westerns. Effectively, the Dirty Harry movies are like Westerns with guns as a cop anyway. And then Unforgiven goes against pretty much all the Western tropes uh, laid on in the end of his kind of full-time acting career. And he's gone on to be a very good director as well. It's hard not to love that movie. 
Yeah, it's sensational. Um, mm. Absolutely sensational. And brilliant performances from everybody in it. So let's move on. What, where, where do you want to start, Will? Yeah, look, it's a pretty busy day uh, sports-wise. Obviously, you've been going through some of the main stories there in the papers, but tonight Liverpool have got the chance to go top of the Premier League. They have to avoid defeat at home against their rivals, Manchester United. You remember the reverse fixture back at Old Trafford earlier in the season where Liverpool won by five goals to nil. Uh, Liverpool, who are on track to potentially win four trophies this season after getting through to the FA Cup final at the weekend, are unbeaten in 12 in the league. Looks like Bruno Fernandes, despite that car accident he had at the weekend, will be available to play. It's unknown if Cristiano Ronaldo will play following the uh, passing of of his newborn boy uh, overnight. A victory for United would move them level on points with fourth place Tottenham. Fulham have got the chance to go up to the Premier League for next season. They can officially secure promotion if they win against Preston tonight. Top of the air Tristy League Premier Division has tightened up a lot over the last three days. Derry City's lead at the top is now down to one point. Suffered their first defeat at the weekend. Dropped points again last night. Held to a one-all draw against Drada. Shamrock Rovers moving within a point of the Candy Stripes. Danny Mandreu scoring in the second half as Shamrock Rovers beat Dundalk at Tallis Stadium by one goal to nil. Elsewhere, Bowes winning on the road against Shelburne. Quite remarkable that Shell's form is all away from home as opposed to at home. Beaten 4-1 by Bowes at Tolka Park. Carlos Sullivan came back to haunt his former side as Sligo Rovers won 1-0 at Finn Harps. And UCD's winless run at the bottom is now 11 games after they were beaten 2-1 by St. Pat's. Uh, covered in some of the papers, the interview with Jamie Carragher and Roy Keane. Keane saying it's unlikely he'll be offered the chance to manage another club. The former Manchester United and Republic of Ireland captain held talks, you remember, back with Sunderland in February but ultimately they appointed Alex Neil as their head coach. He most recently worked as Martin O'Neill's assistant with the Republic of Ireland and Nottingham Forest, leaving that role with Forest back in 2019. Keane says it's unlikely he'll get a good opportunity from another club to get back into management. Promoter Frank Warren says Daniel Kinnan has no involvement whatsoever in the upcoming world title fight between Dillian White and Tyson Fury this weekend. top rank chief Bob Arum revealed at the weekend that the criminal cartel boss was paid millions of dollars for his role in arranging the last four fights for the WBC champion Fury, but Warren has told the BBC overnight that Fury's former advisor Kinnahan was not part of any of the negotiations about this weekend's title bout at Wembley. Cork and Kerry into the Airgrid Munster Under-20 Football Championship final. Rhino Donovan with one goal and six points for Cork as they eased past Limerick by 215 to five points last evening. Killian Burke with one-two for Kerry as they defeated Clare by 111 to eight points. Tonight, a semi-final date with Dublin is the reward for the winners of the clash of Leash and Wexford. No Sheen Pepper for Wexford because he came on for around 90 seconds for the Wexford seniors at the weekend in their draw against Galway. 7.30 start for that one at Amore Park, which I know Garrod Hegarty was fuming at the rule last week, but it, it seems slightly crazy. Colin O'Neill can't play for Limerick in the Munster under 20 either after he came on for Limerick against Cork at the weekend. Uh, Mark Allen has got a clash with Ronnie O'Sullivan to look forward to the World Snooker Championship. O'Sullivan could be in trouble for a gesture which was picked up on camera uh, when he missed a black in his match with Dave Gilbert at the weekend. He's been referred uh, for disciplinary action for it, but Alan progressing last night 10 frames to 6 against Scott Donaldson They seem to have a slightly different approach to gesturing to the crowd in the WPBSA than they do in the NBA there was no yeah. uh, you know uh, the fruity language that Owen chose to drop on our, our listeners at 7.47 <laughs> this morning where you know where we, we didn't do a Jack Grealish and uh, pixelate out his mouth or the sound there was no beep uh, you know uh, they do that they take that stuff relatively seriously in snooker apparently they have no sense of humour when it comes to giving the finger the, the, the crowd the bird I think if Owen was at the Crucible he'd probably be referred to a disciplinary committee at the moment uh, for his <laughs> foul mouth this morning but yeah look they've got very strict rules there it's even got to the point of the Crucible where the Coventry fan who used to wear his football jersey into the Crucible a few years ago, that's been banned. You can't get in now if you wear um, jerseys of other sports into the Crucible. So they've got very strict rules. And I don't know, it's very hard to see them actually hand out any kind of punishment to Ronnie O'Sullivan, which won't see him play in the second round against Mark Allen. But I would think that he's probably going to get a fine for his indiscretion at the weekend. And the other story, which has been picked up by some of the papers too, is an interview with Men's Health magazine by Bradley Wiggins, the former Tour de France champion. He's revealed that he was sexually abused when he was a teenager by one of his coaches. The Olympic gold medal winner has said that he was groomed when he was 13 years of age and that the impact of the abuse has carried through into his adult life. Wiggins added that he felt unable to talk to his family about the issue when he was a teenager due to a very difficult relationship which he had with his stepfather. I didn't know that his father had been murdered. That uh, His father was... Um, Australian cycling champion, yeah. Yeah, he'd left the family and they had become uh, separated and not spoken for years and then well, Wiggins had made some kind of peace and then they'd fallen out again it seems and then he was murdered at a house party it was like uh, that's a, an incredible backstory that's you know 
I didn't I probably should have paid a bit more attention to the, the Wigan story and then he's. It, this is actually an interview with Alistair Campbell that he's spoken about this which is obviously horrific for anybody to endure and hopefully it helps some other people who might have suffered similarly to come out and tell their story too um, a couple of other things that we should talk about that we haven't spoken about Shane Larry didn't make the um, performance rankings where would he have been on what was that was the I guess the the uh, battle in your mind where would you have put him I think anywhere other than Red would have been an, an injustice to, to Shane Lowry and, and for his efforts over the course of the weekend because it was an absolute disaster wasn't it the 13th hole the, the, the chip in that just completely overshot overshot the runway and kind of trickled into the water and all his hopes kind of uh, dissolving around him and obviously that's uh, the, the the inability over those last few holes to get himself into a position to just get one more birdie probably would have stung even though the course was playing quite hard over those last few holes on the Sunday uh, I think it's just an, an, an absolute nightmare especially given how Speed did it and I guess where Speed was when he walked off the course before the playoff on Sunday afternoon you had a hunch that maybe he could be involved in the playoff and there might be more to might be more golf to play but you never really thought that that Shane Lowry would would do enough bad to actually allow that to happen and unfortunately that, that's what did happen so I think yes of course he was excellent throughout the course of the weekend uh, having those finishes in back to back weeks as well and and I guess uh, the, the finishing at Honda earlier on the season it's been a very very good season overall but not getting a win is something that's going to stick with him and he's going to need to get one soon you suspect because he's in good form yeah you, you obviously have been uh, following Shane Lowry since he was a kid what, what's hey there we go. There we are. Hank doesn't like uh, Owen putting Shane Larry into the red rankings, but go on. You would have put him in green, I suspect, for the like competing again. I, I did. Here's the worst part. Right? I didn't get to see the back nine because I was actually at a medal presentation where I was sitting one table away from Shane Larry's aunt. And I was at a table with Michael Dignan, um, myself, both at our phones out trying to watch it on the Humble PGA Bragg. Tour app which is not an easy thing to do when you see that at one point Shane Lowry had gone to 14 under par and he'd gone too clear at a point uh, when Cantley had dropped a shot. And you're thinking, perhaps, you know, Shane Lowry's good form, he, like he's at his highest world ranking in 18 months now at this stage, was going to seal the deal. And then you hear about him going into the drink with his second shot on the par three, and then you just kind of think it's going to slip away. But yet, towards the end of the round, you're just hoping that he can get to a playoff with Jordan Spieth because he loves playing at Hilton Head. It's one of those tournaments. And sometimes when someone's in like a good run of form, because it's very clear, Augusta is not a good course for Shane Lowry. And with the exception of the frustrations with Bo about his approach shot, which I think Shane openly has admitted in the interview with Paul Kimmage was his fault and not Bo's, but you have to have some kind of did release he, valve. It still felt a little bit like he was still blaming Bo. It was like, no, well, he gave me the wrong club. Oh, hang yeah. on a second, hang on a second. It's like, no, no, I'm not going to change. Okay, the old, maybe. The old adage goes, Jared, that, you know, if you're a club or two the wrong way, it's the caddy's fault. And if you go left or right, it's your coach's fault. The last thing that a golfer can do when it's so key in an individual sport to be able to show resilience after a bad shot and go back and be confident again is to find any excuse for the <laughs> fact that you've hit a bad shot. Because let's be fair, right? Shane Larry's one of the best short range players in world golf. Realistically, he hit the shot quite badly. He left it 30 yards short. So, wrong club. Um, or whatever has been handed to him by Bo, or whether Bo got the yardage ever so slightly wrong, he just needed someone to blame. Because you're in Augusta, you're trying to battle going down to the uh, back nine on the moving day in a major. Understandably, you're going to lash out at somebody. And the two of them were hugging at the end of it. I'm sure they went for a coffee and went for dinner afterwards, no particular problem. And again, they did quite well at the weekend at Hilton Head. It's just a pity from Shane Lowry's point of view that he wasn't able to close it out and get a win. But uh, whatever watching TV, it's far more agonising when you're at an event as we were on Sunday. We're at a medal presentation for St. Rhinus uh, GA and Camogie team. And there was no big screen in the ballroom that we were in. And I think the 500 people who were at, the award, at that uh, presentation were all following on their phone. It's amazing how many heads were stuck into the PGA Tour app but unfortunately Larry didn't get the job done yeah uh, he is in really good form at the moment and if he can maintain this for the next month or so it's not a bad time of the year to be in good form yeah especially with the majors being that little bit earlier this season as well so yeah look he's, he's doing very well and again I think there'd be a lot to take from Augusta where last year he finished you know, just outside the top 10 it was his best ever finish you know, previous to that he'd never really contended at the Masters you could argue that he wasn't really in contention on Sunday but still got himself a top 5 finish some huge ranking points picked up over the last few weeks and like, he's had a succession of top 7 finishes this year so as you said Ger, it's not a bad time to be informed 330 grand for uh, finishing uh, tied 3rd at the weekend as well so right. not a bad week's work uh, ok let's talk about the weekend's hurling uh, you've got the hurling pod graphic behind you there slightly delayed recording this week when can we expect it do you think 
Uh, should be out around five o'clock, hopefully. Um, Paul Murphy is doing his best to get divorced on his honeymoon currently. He brought the iPad and his microphone with him uh, to record the pod, and he ended up watching both of the Munster Championship games <laughs> on his iPad at the weekend, much to his uh, new wife's chagrin. Uh, but she is allowing him away for about an hour to record this afternoon uh, because, unfortunately, he was on safari yesterday, and we had great plans to record at 5 a.m. on Monday, and I was in bed early after that medal presentation to be awoken by a text from James Skell, Cork's favourite pundit right now, uh, who said, unfortunately, he was sick, so we weren't able to record yesterday. So we're about 24 hours later than planned, but it'll be up uh, later on this evening, probably around 6 or 7 o'clock. Well, lots to consider. Um, we, we, so, uh, yeah, a lot of debate about the quality of fare that we saw in Leinster, but um, this always happens. It, so Limerick are the best team in the country at the moment, but there haven't been that many teams from Munster who've put it up to them in recent years. I seem to remember Kilkenny beating Limerick in an All-Ireland semi-final, you know, in, in, in living memory. I seem to remember uh, Galway putting it up to them a couple of times over the last four or five years too. So let's just, let's just cool the jets on... The only thing that matters is the Munster Hurling Championship for, for a while. The the end of the Wexford Galway game was gloriously dramatic and bonkers and sure leads to the stopwatch coming out on the Sunday game for uh, how long uh, each player had over the ball at the end. But like, you know, I, I think all this is going to do is uh, serve to fuel the fires of uh, Leinster Hurling in particular. Well, look, it sets up a situation, lads, where potentially a team with five points in Leinster might not qualify in the top three and get to the knockout stages of the championship. And it puts that bit of extra importance onto Dublin's trip to Wexford this weekend in the championship because realistically, the way I think both teams have to look at it is Wexford salvaged a point at the weekend with the four late scores from Leach in. Galway should have been almost out of sight at half time with the amount of chances that they missed in the first half. I thought Wexford were very disappointing in the first 35 minutes particularly. They stayed in the game in the second half but didn't look like they were going to get anything from it Galway were six points up even quite late in the game and then Lee Chin comes on just settles the ship a little bit um, he adds that little bit of extra physicality when he comes in I'm sure the debate is going to be there on two sides with Lee Chin but what he brings in the half forward line if he starts if he's fit because it seems he had a bit of a reoccurrence of a hamstring injury after the Waterford game and that's why Wexford have been taking his recovery in a very conservative way but also his long-range free-taking, which we saw towards the end of the game, is very important to have him there. I'm sure look, they'll use Rory O'Connor probably for the shorter-range freeze, but for those a bit further out, Lee Chin is very, very important to the team. Galway, I thought, operated reasonably well in what was a pretty poor fixture overall. Like I thought the quality of the game was poor enough, but it felt like two teams who were you know, going out, kind of feeling their way into the championship, knew the importance of the game uh, with regard to who's going to get out of the province at the end of it. This was still a crucial fixture. And you know, Wexford just about did enough to salvage that point. It'll feel like Galway will almost feel like a defeat as opposed to a draw at the end of it. But Galway should be able to just get things back on track when they play against Westmead this weekend in Salt Hill. Westmead put it up to Kilkenny for pretty much all of the first half. Killian Doyle scored 10 points in the first half and then the big guns came on. Like if, if you're going to keep guns in reserve, have a bazooka and TJ Reid to be able to bring on in the second half and in the end, Kilkenny scored five goals. They still look like they're the best team in Leinster and I like the way that the start has worked out for Kilkenny because they were easing their Ballyhell Shamrocks players back in and that was TJ Reid's first involvement of this season for Kilkenny at the weekend in Mullingar. They will play against Leash at home this weekend, probably should win that and then they go to Salt Hill where if they beat Galway, they pretty much have got a foot and a half into the Leinster final midway through the campaign. This weekend, the crucial fixture is obviously Wexford hosting Dublin. Dublin really kind of flattered at the weekend with the two-point win against uh, Leash. Didn't play well, despite the fact they'd won very comfortably against Leash in the league a couple of weeks ago. Ender Rowland had another free, which potentially could have got another goal for Leash late on in the game. Leash were competitive throughout and would probably be happy enough with that start, even though their manager, Cheddar Plunkett, said moral victories are no use to them. It was about trying to get a couple of points at Parnell Park. Leash will feel that they're going to get a victory against Westmead to stay in the Leinster Championship for next year. And Dublin are going to have to up their performance if they're going to get something from Wexford this weekend because I think Wexford are going to be uh, very much improved on what they showed last week. OK. Are Cork All-Ireland contenders? Not if they play Limerick again, I don't think. Um, again, like there were so many parallels with the way that they faded out in the All-Ireland final. Like The concern would be, as good as I think Cork are, particularly from midfield up, lads, if you only score one point from play in the last half hour or so of that game, that's simply not good enough. And 
Limerick took complete control of the game, particularly from the start of the second half. From 40 minutes on, there was only one team in the game, and Limerick were so, so comfortable. Like, there were a lot of plus points for Limerick if you want to focus on them. Like, look at the versatility they've got in their team, where Casey can go in a cornerback, you can put Kyle Hayes back up into the full forward line, and seamlessly, it's almost like plug and play. They can both fit into the system, and things just rock on and like they go down to Porky Cueve they survived the fact that Kingston had put the ball in the net 16 seconds into the game and after that Limerick were just able to take control and again we saw how good Dimmer Burns is we talk about you know how much of a difference Lee Chin being able to put the ball over from long range Burns was able to punish Cork every time that they gave away a freeze and Cork I think quite simply didn't give away enough freeze during the game I still think that that defence with Cork is a little bit too nice and a little bit too soft. You would hope that some of the times that Limerick were running through them, that they would just draw a foul, take a free, and allow Galan or Burns to put it over. But they, there was just that lack of intensity in the tackle from Cork, which you'd expect if they're going to be able to get past Limerick later in the championship. That's not to say that Cork won't qualify or can't get out, but Clare, the one team who weren't playing last weekend, must be licking their lips about the possibility of beating Cork at Semple Stadium because of the fact that now Cork had to give away home advantage due to the Ed Sheeran gig that now that opens the door for Clare maybe to get through as the third team and like in fairness to Tipperary I thought Tip hurled very well against Waterford probably should have been more ahead at half time at Welsh Park didn't do enough and then a story of a sub coming on in Austin Gleeson helped to switch the game for Waterford in the second half and Waterford who've been so impressive and go to Limerick this weekend had to grind out a result in a way that they haven't had to because of the very comfortable victories they had in the league semi-final and the final against Wexford and against Cork respectively had to do a little bit dirtier and more grindy against Tipperary at the weekend but that tipperary Clare game becomes really important now this weekend to see who's going to qualify for Munster and then you've got Waterford going to Limerick in a way it's a pity that Limerick or Waterford didn't get caught out there because it would have added maybe that little bit of extra spice to the game between Waterford and Limerick this weekend yeah. you would think they're both going to qualify even despite who wins this weekend but yeah. it should still be a good fixture particularly because we didn't get to see Waterford against Limerick in the league I don't think Waterford can be too uh, expectant given that their track record in the round robin qualifier round robin uh, Munster Championship is actually horrific so that was that when, when there must have been some ghosts sitting in the dressing room at half time against Tipperary going what? how's this happening again we're supposed to be the superior force here we, we know we're the better team we've got silverware gleaming in our trophy cabinet what's going on here so I, I think maybe spiritually it was more important than even performance that the, the quality of the performance in the second half while it was clearly better in the first half was less important than just getting the win in that game yeah, yeah, get, getting over the line is all that really mattered. And like Kyo had an excellent game, particularly for Tipperary. It was kind of a, a coming of age performance for him, really. And like when you consider how many players are missing for Tipperary, especially not to Callanan for the start, after losing so much experience with the two Mars retiring in off season as well. I like I know Tommy Walsh was saying to you last week that he was expecting a kick out of Tipperary when they went to Walsh Park. I really wasn't expecting Tipperary to be in what felt like a very strong position. Do you want to let him in? Up. Do you want to let him in? Is that, is that what needs to happen here? Is, is what, What's he upset about? I'm not sure. I think I think the neighbours have literally come home from work. I think they usually come home bang on nine o'clock. And I've got a feeling he's very upset about the fact that the neighbours are at the front door. So hopefully he'll stop in a second. Hank, stop. Now, there we go. I think I've kind of caught him to stop. Oh, oh a you're, you're like, uh, what's his name? The dog whisperer. Yeah, I think stop is just about the word it works until the front the door opens again. I can hear the next door neighbors open the door and there we go. Uh, so it's a, it's a losing battle for me here at the moment. Uh, a bit like Tipperary in the second half once Ozzy Gleason came on for Waterford. But um, look, again, I kind of half repeat myself here, but the fact that Waterford got a win on the first day is all that matters. Because I think, as you said, they will be very aware the last two years of the round robin, Waterford had a horrific record in the round robin itself. Actually, the two knockout years probably helped Waterford in their runs to an All-Ireland final and All-Ireland semi-final. It, it'll be interesting this weekend, even though I think both teams will qualify ultimately for the Munster final and will qualify out in Waterford and Limerick just to see how close Waterford are, because we didn't get to see them play against Limerick uh, since that day of the Bales of Hay in the all Ireland semi-final. So, intrigued to see how it goes this weekend, but there's a long road to go in Munster, and I really think that Clare will feel, because Clare coming in totally under the radar, like we were probably guilty of it on the hurling pod last week too, because Clare weren't playing, nobody's been bigging up Clare or talking about them in any way or talking about the fact that they've got some players coming back in. Davy Fitz, Fitz has been talking them up actually, wow. saying that the quality of players they have would be enough. He's right in the mirror today. Should be enough to um, see them through at the weekend. So, you know, he certainly feels like expectation. Uh, we should be expecting something from this Clare team. 
well, if they come through against Tipperary, they've got a really good chance to qualify because Clare will be licking their lips potentially about that game against Cork, which, you know, two wins will probably put a team into a decent position in Munster with the way things are looking currently because I'd be surprised if anyone beats Limerick. Now, maybe that's the cue for Waterford to beat Limerick at the weekend at the Gaelic Grounds and Waterford to be talked up then as potential All-Ireland champions. But I think Limerick will sweep their fixtures, lads. And if Limerick sweep their fixtures, it's a dogfight then as the dog continues to bark. Um, for the rest of the uh, teams to try and qualify in Munster. He seems to be barking at the hurling pod. Uh, that dog has more fight than the Cork defence, says Powell, 74. That's, that's <laughs> a very good observation, Powell, and probably correct after what we saw at the weekend. Uh, that is a genuine concern. Like, there's so much <laughs> silk throughout that Cork team. There's so much running hurling. He is literally Kate's barking at the, at the TV. Look, it's, uh, it's, it's, he doesn't like... What, what does he not like? Well, there's hammering going on upstairs now currently too, so okay. I'm not sure exactly why everyone has sprung into action just as we decide to talk about hurling here, but these are all uh, topics that we will try and get through between the barks and the hurling pod later on as well. Yeah, I don't know what you're going to do for like the hour and a half of the hurling pod where he just has to be a, a present and like uh, getting the attention that he, he needs and requests. Uh, all right, are you worried about the dubs? Like, cause we had such high hopes after the start of the league season. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, hang on a second here. Well, look, Ultimately, they got the results at the weekend, even if it is just getting out by a couple of points against Leash when everyone was expecting them to win that fixture. We'll know a lot about Wexford. We'll know a lot about Wexford and Dublin once that game between Dublin and Wexford finishes this weekend. Uh, I still think they're a little bit short in scores, and I still think it comes back to haunt them a little bit that they don't have, say, a really star forward within their forward line when it comes to some of the really big fixtures. Like, will they have enough to overcome a Kilkenny, a Waterford, or a Limerick when the season goes on? They have still got a shout of qualifying, but I think to qualify in Leinster, they may well have to get a victory against Wexford this weekend because I don't expect them to beat Kilkenny. And I'm expecting that Galway, with the way that the fixtures fall, should be able to naturally take out Westmead and to take out Leash. And they'll really fancy coming out on top against Dublin as well. So you're thinking Kilkenny will qualify. Galway still probably, for me, are slight second favourites now ahead of Wexford after what we saw last weekend. But Wexford put in a good performance against Dublin, then they're set up nicely for going to... Um, they go to Kilkenny, I think, in the last round of games at, at Nolan Park, and they've got Leash and Westmead sandwiched in between that. So Wexford might have enough points in the bag to have already qualified by the time they go to play against Kilkenny. It's amazing how in Leinster, by comparison to Munster, the amount of home and away games you have could well prove to be quite important, the way that the fixtures fall. Yeah. And Wexford would definitely think that they needed to have points in the bag from the home games against Galway and Dublin before beating the two teams you'd be expected to beat and then to get a result against Kilkenny. So, yeah, I, I think probably you're still looking at Kilkenny, Galway and Wexford to qualify from Leinster. Dublin with a little bit of work to do, but it can be blown wide open if they can beat Wexford at Wexford Park at the weekend. The uh, summer of Ed Sheeran is going to have the most impact on Irish sport of any performing artist ever, given the rugby fixture is now going to be in the Aviva as well. So uh, I think we're going to be talking about that for a while to come. Will, good stuff. Thanks a million. Thanks, lads. Apologies about the uh, barking. It's amazing how he's now stopped to be as quiet as possible just so we finish. But, uh. Well, there you go. Uh, Bosang David says, how many other people's dogs barked when they heard Will's dog barking? It's turned into a barking echo chamber here. So the barking <laughs> is general all over Ireland at the moment. Hank, uh, you're an influencer. Congratulations. <laughs> seven minutes past nine. He needs his own Instagram account. <laughs> Uh, or maybe Instagram's past eight it needs to be TikTok, of course. Uh, OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. How far away are you from getting a dog on? What's your... Um... A long, 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 long way away. You'd get a yeah. goldfish first. Is that the level of commitment that you'd have? Yes, yes. Goldfish sounds about right, to be honest. Goldfish and then maybe one day a cat and then maybe one day a dog. You're more of a cat man now. That also was the other thing. Was... I, I I, think you can be both. People people like to be divisive. People like to be black or, or like things black or white these days. But it, you know what? We can we can love both. We can love cats and dogs. It's the level of care that you have to give to a cat, which is basically leave the food out occasionally, make sure that shit gets cleared out of the litter tray and away you go. Yeah, and then laugh at them like they're extremely funny creatures. Whereas with dogs, it, for for every laugh you give them, you have to also give them so much attention. Can't be arsed with that, like, walk them. There's only so much attention you have to give in your life and you're just not ready to commit to a dog. <laughs> really, really, I'm not. Just, I, just want to be, I just want to be amused by a cat for a while and then move on to something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Eight minutes past nine this morning. We're uh, going to take a quick break and hopefully fix all this. And then we're going to talk um, uh, rugby with Alan Quinlan. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Newspapers have called it the greatest club game ever. Munster legends Alan Quinlan and Neil Briggs are joining forces to bring you all the latest analysis, news, interviews and so much more. The strength of Munster rugby has always been the big boys up front. There's a lot of pressure on these guys continuously. I'm actually really, really excited for it. The Red 78 with Alan Quinlan and Neil Briggs. Available every Wednesday. Don't miss a moment of action. Subscribe to the Rugby Channel on the OTB Sports app and turn on your notifications now. Yeah, well, it was a great day, though. Super day. Like, you know, it's as the lads there were talking about it, it's just one of those races that you dream about winning. And, you know, it's been there for as long as we can remember. And, and uh, I remember... I remember Arkle winning it, I remember Flying Bolt winning it, and I remember all those great horses winning it. And Tom Draper was, when I, when I was growing up, I was, you know, a lot of kids go around with albums of football players and this, that and the other. I was, I had a, a, a big old um, deposit book, whatever, one of those, like, whatever you call them, check books of them, like big... A, and a scrap, and I and I, and I had um, it, my my scrapbook was full of Tom Draper. Wow! I was all, all Tom Draper's horses, Tom Draper's horses, and that I followed that. I didn't follow footballers. I followed I followed uh, Tom Draper's horses. So I think Tom won it seven or eight years in a row. Yeah, seven years in a row. Think about yeah. That. And uh, there I, I was a great feeling that day to stand in the winners' enclosure and think, well, this is for Tom Draper stood, you know, because he was my idol, you know, and. Uh, uh, that was it. it was a fabulous day for me. FBD Insurance knows this sound spells trouble for van drivers. But if you're an existing FBD customer, you'll get 15% off a new van insurance policy. It's how we're keeping you and your van on the road. Visit fbd.ie or contact your local branch. FBD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. Terms and conditions apply. 15% discount available on new commercial motor policies only when an existing FBD farm, business, car or home policy is in place. FBD Insurance Group Limited, trading as FBD Insurance, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Commercial motor insurance is underwritten by FBD Insurance PLC. OTB AM With Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. The 150th running of the Boys Sports Irish Grand National was won yesterday by outsider Lord Lariat for trainer Dermot McLaughlin. 40 to 1 shot uh, when they went to post. Paddy O'Hanlon was in the saddle. There's a great feature on our YouTube page actually where Dermot McLaughlin talked about uh, exactly what goes into winning the race. Having won it last year with a 150 to 1 outsider, that's in an interview with Ashing O'Reilly. During the ads there, you heard Noel Mead talking about what it's actually like to win the race. He had Bunny Boiler in 2002. That was at last week's roadshow at Fairy House. Horse racing on Off the Ball is with Horse Racing Ireland. The hashtag is every racing moment. Now, it's uh, 12 minutes past nine this morning here. This Tuesday morning on OTBAM, delighted to say Alan Quinlan is with us. Alan, good morning to you. Morning, Joe. How are you? Yeah, good. Um, Owen put the two-legged rugby in the green. I suspect if you're Ulster, you'd be like, mm, maybe we could just go back to the one legs and take the result from uh, winning away in France. And it, it, like it was on the verge of being an iconic victory for Ulster and an opportunity to play Munster in the Aviva, which they would absolutely have relished. So, you know, you can just feel the rest of their season slipping through their fingers in those final few moments as world-class talent does what world-class talent does yeah i think that's the key what you're saying is it's uh dupont into mac again um they just punished ulster didn't they um it was heartbreaking stuff you know they were a couple of minutes away from being in the quarterfinal and you know probably and I, i'm not sure if that game was going to be in the viva was it maybe you're right um oh, or was it going to be in the kingspan no i think a quarterfinal was going to be in the kingspan right so um they certainly would have fancied their chances with, um, at home to Munster if they got to the quarterfinal. And then you're in a semi final and they'd have been in the Aviva because of, of the ranking in the pool stages. So they, they were so close to, to being, you know, going right to a final here. Um, it was heartbreaking stuff. And I think the, the try, the late try to Toulouse got the week before when I was watching that match, I just kind of cringed a little bit when that happened. And said, you know that that could be the key, that could be the difference. And um, I just think the intercept um, try, the break from into Mac as well uh, for Ramos's try, and then Dupont at the end. There's three tries there that I know 
I listened to Dan McFarland speaking about it afterwards. You know, players getting caught on inside inside shoulders, and and obviously the inter- intercept was great anticipation from him, and that's there, what Toulouse is, do, is, isn't it? Is there anything McCluskey is supposed to do better on that point? Like, is he is he late to it? Is the pass bad? Is there, or is that just how if you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna play an attacking aggressive style of rugby, occasionally you play with fire and on the balance this is going to happen once every hundred times it just unfortunately happened against one of the best players in the world that's that's for the inter- intercept you're talking about yeah. Um, yeah I look I think it's a little bit of a wrap around the win in the line out and um, it's just good anticipation I think for him he takes a chance and we, sometimes we see players do that they leave a little gap in their defensive line um, I think it was way too flat it was right right on the gain line they overran it a little bit um, so it was, I don't think it was McCluskey's fault. I just okay. think um, they took it right to the line, and that's the risk you run. Um, it's it's brilliant for him, um, you know, and that's a significant score. They were on uh, under the the pump there at that stage, and and that's what they do. And and you know, when France play Ger, we talk about Intermac Dupont all the time. Um, they're such confidence based players. They're world class with their their execution and and their confidence and belief. And and if you can't stop them. The chances are they're going to have a, a significant say in the outcome of the game, and they continuously do. So that's uh, obviously to, to lose power as well. And I thought Ulster did so many things so well over over the two legs. Um, the, I look, I think the whole round sixteen was was brilliant. The excitement of, of all the games um, was fantastic, and you know the EPCR had issues, and there was obviously issues in the pool stages. Um, but I think the competition has been ignited by the round 16 matches now. But that'll be no good to Dan McFarland and Ulster. And I think um, agonisingly close, I, I really thought they'd get through on, on Saturday night in the Kingspan. But they just made too many mistakes. And, you know, they're the, the kind of crucial things that, that go against you in these tight games when you're playing against a, 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 a team that really, from the pool stages, were only barely got into the round 16 and now you're fancying their chances they're, they're getting it right and they'll be a very very difficult team to stop um, from going all the way in this competition Having scraped through a couple of rounds in a row now Alan have there been any Toulouse weaknesses that have been exposed? I think the, the, the I think when you hold on to the ball against Toulouse and that, that like it's not very it's it's pretty obvious when you're playing against a strong side that's um, and a powerful side like Toulouse that they're gonna and and the vast a lot an awful lot of the French players they're gonna they they're gonna back their physicality on and they're gonna try and out muscle you and if you can stand up to that and get your set piece right and and hold on to the ball, which Ulster did brilliantly and I said it before round one and again it's I'm no rocket scientist to be saying this but you have to attack. Um, and Ulster did that. They attacked Toulouse in Toulouse. I know the sending off was significant, um, but if you're a side that's pretty dominant all the time, you would imagine that if you're used to having the ball and 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 at a lot of possession, that if if you if the opposition can turn the tide and that and recycle the ball and hold on to it really well and attack you, well, it's something you're not used to doing. So I think. Um, obviously, you've got to match them physically, but you've got to hold on to the ball for long periods and then hope that um, they, they get a, you find a soft shoulder somewhere and get through them. Um, but I think the, the difference, and we always say it on about the French teams, is mentally um, that they can drop their heads a little bit. The, the Toulouse players are, are different. You know, They're international players and they love this competition and they have a history in the competition. So... They just look like they never really dropped their heads in the two legs, and and that's been the key. So, is there any weakness? Well, if you hold the ball for a long period of time, I think you can find find opportunities. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about Connacht Leinster, is it? It, um, it seems like it was a, a lifetime ago. Uh, what what can Connacht do to make sure that this season isn't a write off? And um, what what is there that Irish rugby can learn from how Connacht performed over the two legs? Um, yeah, it was, it's it's really it's a tough one from you know we spoke about it on Friday that or on Thursday that they're just underpowered a little bit, aren't they? Um, there's some, and Andy Friend was talking about 
Um, the players, not the Leinster players being more professional, doesn't believe that they're better players, but they're better professionals. I don't know about that. I think the Leinster players are better players. They're better players than any other provinces in Ireland, um, and that's that's blatantly obvious with their with their international representation. I just think Leinster got a, or Connacht have got to. Um, in an ideal world, you'd love to just bulk up your pack a little bit, particularly in the front five. I think they have a lot of good players. The way they play, um, what can they learn from it? Well. Leinster are capable of doing that to most teams and we saw what they did to Munster a couple of weeks ago down at Thoman Park so Connacht are not the only ones who've come come under the wrath of, of, of Leinster so um, I think the problem for, for Connacht this season has been just really inconsistent in in uh, in in the URC you know they've lost eight games that's too many games to, to be losing if you want to be getting into the playoffs um, there's one or two ahead of them could lose a game or two in the next two weeks and could be up at that number as well and they could there's there you know Munster in danger of missing out on on you know seventh or eighth spot the way things are going um, given the fixtures it's going to be very very difficult for them they've got to try and win an Ulster but for Connacht um, I think if the season peters out and they don't make Europe and the, and the top eight in the URC I think it'll obviously be very very disappointing. What can they do? I know he's one or two more signings to come in, Andy Friend, um, but it's probably becoming more resilient, um, not making mistakes and not giving the ball away. I think they were very, very sloppy, particularly in the game last Friday. They turned the ball over way too much. I know it doesn't matter, but the missed kick early on seemed to just take whatever. Yeah. It's so brittle, the confidence, that everything needs to go right for you. And all week you're saying everything needs to go right. So everybody, and it's just like from that point forward, it, I, I'm not saying that it had an impact at all on the outcome, but uh, maybe they would have sustained their pressure for more because they started with they started with all the piss and vinegar you would expect. You know, it was blood and thunder, and then the the miss kick is like oh, and the head drops. It, it was it was it was significant, and I think um, they got really soppy then, and they their body language changed a little bit. And I think look, it's very, very difficult uh, against against Leinster at home. And once they got their confidence up and got their flow going, and um, the Gibson Park try, the length of the field try, it's 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 just like if you're in the in in that kind of team, you're thinking we've been battering away here, doing a lot of good stuff, and suddenly this is what they can do. That was game so over. It does, yeah, it does affect your yeah. confidence. So. Um, you can't just create a jar and say, well, we're going to be mentally strong next year. I just think it's the way you train, the way you prepare. And maybe that's what Andy Friend was indicating, that they need to be better better professions in their, their diligence about everything they do in the game, on and off the field, their accuracy around the breakdown. Um, if he wants to play a really expansive, exciting game, which that's what Andy Friend wants to do, that they've got to be really diligent in doing that yeah. um, I think they came up with too many mistakes and turned the ball over too much in the game on Friday and then Leinster punished them well, I hope he can turn it around because he's he seems like a really good person and it seems like the rugby ideals that he's trying to get across and his team are, are trying to to play are the right ones and you see you know the quality of signing that they made with Mac Hansen but also how quickly Hansen could step from his environment into the Ireland environment and, and not miss a beat and like I don't know. It just maybe it needs more investment from. The yeah, they've a lot of good, but they've a lot of good players who will get better and they learn from this experience. And that's that's um, that's you know they need a little bit of time um, to, to 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 grow and 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 probably learn how to win these games and be more consistent as as I said in the league. You know, there's a couple of those league games that. Do you remember? I look back on be really disappointed with. Do you remember there was a period of time when Andy Farrell worked with Munster? when they were in between coaches uh, Farrell was the assistant coach at that stage and he went I don't know how long a period that was in my in my head it's like eight or nine weeks or maybe a bit longer is that about right does that ring a bell um, I don't know how long it was but I remember yeah it was between um, Rusty Erasmus and Johan Van Bran I think and um, uh, you think that maybe they would benefit from, from some of the Irish coaches well I'm thinking um, like being world class the stuff that doesn't take talent if you were to inject Paul O'Connell for a couple of months in there as like a, an add-on while just, I don't know I'm just trying to think of something that will help the team and I'm not saying that the current coaching ticket isn't doing the right stuff but 
if the head coach is saying that we actually need an injection of and it sounds culture more than talent is what he believes and you're saying talent obviously is is, is right well there. It, it's probably a bit of both you know what i mean i'm not i'm not saying it's completely i think when you're in the irish squad that's the ultimate place to be and when you have so many good leaders who've won things and they do things at, at such such a professional way of, of how they look after themselves, um, students of the game, how they watch the videos, the, the quality of coaches and the stuff you learn there. And I think it makes a difference to your, to your, to your pr- provincial side when you have, and they had a number of players there up with, up with Ireland training with them. So, you know, you always think, God, if you can bring back any sort of detail or, you know, the, the, particularly on the Joe Schmidt era, there was always stuff uh, being spoken about. I would hear, always hear stuff of the quality of coaching, the quality of detail that Joe was giving the players, the tiny little things that you don't maybe think about, yeah. that he's kind of unraveling that you can bring back and you try and teach other players, younger players, this is how you do it. This is how you, um, you know, what you do around the field at certain areas, how you've got to get back up off the ground, get back in shape and attack. Um, certain things like that, um, and 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 probably that is is something that you know the the international players maybe need to drive a little bit more in Connacht. Yeah, I, I, is it ridiculous to think that maybe O'Connell could get involved at some level? I, I'm sure there's already. Well, I'd like I'd like I'd like to see him go back to Munster. I think the way they and and go to all the provinces because I think if um, no, certainly look at the Irish breakdown. I think you know he would have been. Um, a big believer in Joe Schmidt stuff and probably would have learned a lot there from him. And you learn from different coaches, their approach approach to the game and their views and, and the way they see the game going. So I think, look, having someone like Paul, yeah, obviously spend some time with him would, would certainly help help young players and show them that this is the standard, this is the detail that's needed. Okay. Is there a possibility that he might be on the Munster coaching ticket? No, no. I'm saying right. I'd like to see him go back. I thought you were breaking the news was uh, there. No, no, no. I'd like to see him go back and do some breakdown work there as well. And, uh, and you know, I think that's been one of the keys to Ireland's um, improvements is, is def- definitely the speed of ball and mm. and the, the the way they protect the ball. Obviously, the French game, there was a few issues around the breakdown. But, um, you know, what, what I hear and you just look at Josh van der Fleer and he openly spoken about um, the way Paul has helped his game improve. And every yeah. time I see him carry a ball now, I think of O'Connell. Uh, it's not solely down to that because obviously Josh van der Fleer is very, very powerful and quick, but he's started to back himself in the last the last year with carries and he's so strong and effective now and just keeps his legs alive. So, you know, and obviously if Paul is coaching the national side or on the breakdown or even Simon Eastby defensively or John Fogarty, Mike Cat, Andy Farrell, any of the coaches that, you know, if they can go back in... But I suppose the timing of all that stuff is 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 um, probably pre-season is the best time for, yeah. for those things to happen if they were to happen. Yeah, OK. Look, let's talk about the big story of the weekend. We have this uh, series of pictures from Brendan Moran uh, at Sports File that I just want to put up. I, I When Munster scored the try where Dialende goes in in the corner, I was like, how did that actually happen? And you can't really tell from the TV pictures, but it's an absolutely beautiful no-look, back-of-the-hand pass, from Simon Zebo, just as the touchline is about to swallow him up and you think the opportunity is gone and they've blown this somehow but it's one of the best tries in Europe that we've seen from Munster in a long time absolutely delicious stuff finished off with that beautiful flourish as well where the slightly unnecessary dive but yeah absolutely this is going to look good smacking the ball down thank you very much uh, you must have been pretty happy with that yeah, I just think that that's 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 what Simon Zebra can do, isn't it? Um, it's that little bit of brilliance or magic that can unlock a defence. Like a lot of players would have been tackled out into touch there, and the ball it would have been a line out to Exeter. Um, he has, and we're talking about kind of the anticipation or taking a chance where there's risk reward or in sport, in all in all sport, um, no matter what happens, Zebra is always going to take a chance. And he has the skill set to be able to do something like that. I like we couldn't see, you know, you couldn't see it properly on TV because um, it. Everyone just expected him to be tackled into touch, and suddenly Dialanda has the ball in his hands, and it's a try. And um, it just felt that um, they created that 
they probably deserved that just the way they played in that game and, and there was a different feel to the whole game and, and it was absolutely sublime from Zebo, I think and and that's what he can do and that's his capabilities and um, it was it was it was brilliant to see and the crowd loved it everybody loved it and it was a great finish to the game and gave them that little bit of comfort in the end that that probably they 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 created with with the intensity that they brought on Saturday. Is Jack O'Donnell who's back for station eight? Perhaps all this time. We can... um, yeah, possibly. Um, I think he was probably that's where he was. He was uh, he traditionally started out as an eight, but um, you've got to be play, able to play right across the back row now. But I think the and that's probably one key area that the balance of that back row was brilliant on on Saturday. Um, I think uh, John Hodnett you know, over the, the two games was has been outstanding as well. And to see Peter Romani, it's not just um you know, traditionally you think of the line out steals and the, the couple of turnovers that break down, those kind of big moments that that you highlight. But I just think he's his aggression and his tackle, um couple of tackles he put in, turnovers, just small things that that make a huge difference and stop the opposition getting over the game line. So it it was great to see. And if you're if you're back row, and I always say this, I keep saying it, um, if you have a dominant back row in a match, there's a chance you're going to be winning that match because they're influencing you know, what what happens when you don't have the ball and when you have the ball. So probably need to get more carries out of the back row. And I think Jack O'Donoghue, who I just thought some of the lines he ran, this, uh, the body position, a little bit of footwork and contact was, was, was excellent. So... Um, there were a couple of little, wasn't a, there were a couple of knock-ons that I'd say if you had back and if if they hadn't been knocked on they were going to go for huge gains where that line that you're talking about the aggression and so like it feels like he's he's still improving and if they can keep this team together now they're going to cause trouble for to lose I know the controversy over the Ed Sheeran concert is is raging I kind of feel like that's just bad luck you know like they they desperately it, it, need. it is Chair and the reality is you know that that concert and I know lots of People were on to me about this and what why the hell are Munster prioritizing the Ed Sheeran concert over a quarter final? They're not. This this was probably booked 14, 15 months ago. Yeah. Um it was it was muted during COVID. They lost so much money. Um lots of pay cuts. And I'm not talking about the players, I'm talking about staff. There was people let go from Munster Rugby. They had no gates for probably a year or two years. Um they have financial problems and issues. And plus the quarterfinals are never on in May, are they? Can you I can they're never on in May. They're always on in April. So, of course, the, the season has changed this year. It's a bit longer with the summer tours in July. Um, but the, the Ed Sheeran thing was, it wasn't just decided six months ago. It's been a year and a half in the making. And, you know, they were five minutes away from being in Belfast anyway. So I think they just couldn't take the risk of not, not allowing it to happen. And um, no, it's a shame. It's a shame. Because it's, obviously it's, Tom and Park is would be significant to have it there, but yeah. I think when people realise the money and the financial part of it, well, you know, there's there's nothing they can do now. Liam Tolan was on, uh, he was on off the ball on News Talk doing the game live, and he was saying after the match that he knew people who turned down the opportunity to get free tickets to the game at the weekend. It wasn't a sellout, so it's like you know the the anger has to be mitigated by the fact that it wasn't sold out for a home leg where it was really important that they did create that cauldron of, a, of an atmosphere and now they're going to be playing one of the best teams in the world and it's a real opportunity for them it's not like the Aviva is an, is an unfriendly ground they've played they've all played there loads of games it's the home of Irish rugby at the moment and it's a good opportunity for them to go and say yeah we are now one of we're, we're back to being a team who expects to be in semi-finals and finals of the European Cup and the performance that they put in would give them a lot of confidence going into a game against Toulouse, surely? Yeah, you've got to be so much more robust though, when you play Toulouse. I think if you go back to the quarterfinal last year, um, did so many good things in attack and were were brilliant in offloading the ball and being, um, and just attacking Toulouse throughout the game. And then you just, every kind of 10 minutes, they just give up a try from poor defence, someone breaking a line. It's some brilliance from Toulouse, which you're going to expect. Um but I, I I think going to the Aviva, as you say, it's very, very, very valid what you say about the, you know, lots of the players are used to it. Toulouse still have to come to Dublin. I think it does take away a little bit of um, the intimidation probably and the, the crowd noise at home. But hopefully lots of Munster, Munster supporters will go to the match and go to the Aviva and that they get 30,000, 40,000 there. And, uh, 
And, you know, it's still, no matter where you play to lose at this stage, it's going to be a tough game. Um, playing them away from, out of France is obviously better. Playing them in Thomond Park is better again, but the Aviva is not, it wouldn't be a major issue for me. And I think, you know, they're going to get, they're going to make some money out of the gate receipts there. And um, it's not all about making money, but the reality is, you know, you have Munster fans calling for more signings and more investments and, you know, the money is not there. So these are financial decisions that were made 18 months ago when when, when things were pretty bleak for all sporting organisations. So it is what it is. It's on the Aviva. And it's not, you know, I think it'll be pretty exciting for for some of the players who haven't played there with Munster or with Ireland. Um, and enough of them have. So it's not it's not completely alien to them. Has it saved Munster season? Um, it just depends what happens. Um, it's still going to be very difficult to beat Toulouse, but I think what happened last Saturday just you just had the feel that yes, this this is this is, we need more of this. Even if we don't win the games, we need more of this kind of organisation um, resilience, not just the passion and heart that you saw over in Exeter, and that's probably what won them the game. Let's be honest, uh, won them the two legs was the defence over in Exeter and the, the never say die attitude. That that they're they're non negotiables, Ger, for me with Monster. It, it just has to happen all the time. That that passion, that desire, that that brute force is there, that effort level. And then it's it's about upskilling the players more. And that's the whole idea of the change now and what we want to see. We want to see the players upskill, be able to play a little bit better, become more confident in themselves. Um and that's that. Hopefully, what what can happen? And I think it, it it ignited the and what Liam was saying about the fans. You know, there was a feeling last week that that's that's what we need and that's what we want. Even if we're not winning competitions, we just need to see that kind of fight and that a monster team having a go. It wasn't perfect. There was probably issues again at the weekend around some of the attack, but it's just much more energetic and enthusiastic to see him playing like that. And uh, but the problem you have now with Toulouse is. If Toulouse come on and, and kind of do what Leinster did in Thoman Park a few weeks ago and expose them like that, well, then it kind of has a real kind of ne- negative effect towards the end of the season. And for for Munster, in, as I said, in the URC, they go to Belfast on Friday night. Um, it's a must-win game. They have three games left. And, you know, they're sitting fifth in the table now on, on 47 points. And the Sharks, Edinburgh, the Bulls, they were all right behind them. Um, and the way results could go this weekend, they could end up in seventh or eighth position after after this weekend. We've gone a bit over time, but I, I do want to talk about, it's Craig Casey's 23rd birthday today. I was just Googling it there and it turns out, it's happy birthday, Craig Casey. Uh, when he comes off the bench, there's like this kind of um, Tony Ward-esque jinkiness, which you're like, wow, that's like, and you see the impact that DuPont had. Uh, Whoever comes in next as well as the attack coach and obviously Graham Rowntree, they have this incredible talent there. And also it looks like, fingers fingers crossed, touch wood, a period of fitness behind Joey Carby that we're beginning to see effortless kicking style off the tee in uh, howling winds and also just calmness of the distribution. It looks like, you know, I would feel very, very positive if I'm a Munster fan off the back of what I've seen and the fact that the new regime will be slightly different, but we'll have some continuity. Yeah, you, I wouldn't get carried away uh, in the sense that, um, you know, all is not perfect, but I think there's definitely, you know, you, you can use a game like this um, to change things and, and get a surge of energy, surge of confidence. And, and Carberry was very composed. I thought he was... Um, and we've seen glimpses of that this year, that, that talent. I love the fact that he, you know, saw the gap accelerated given he went through a you know a, a, a pro, um, step to prop Harry Williams and and, a, and one of the back rowers as well but the acceleration the confidence to do that like Intimac does there's no reason why Joey Carberry was an Int- Intimac a few years ago and, and that's the kind of footwork and acceleration and pace that he has um, so that was really important there's a lot of young players that you can you can start to change the way they play around and, and the attack is going to be vital um, not just in the back line just right across the board and, and upskilling the players around their decision making their anticipation when someone makes a line break and there is 
the best teams do it. Watch the Intermac step and line break. You know, yeah, it's 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 simple stuff, Jared, that he breaks through a line. But what do you have? You have Intermac on his shoulder and Ramos. Yeah, those two players. If they're not if they're not anticipating his line break and his brilliance. There's no try at the end of the field. No, he gets and swallowed times, up and it's like he gets yeah, isolated and, and the commentary goes, yeah. And that's yeah. it, you yeah. know. So it's it's that that anticipation from support players. So, um, But look, there was a lot of positive signs at the weekend and right. it just has a different feel about it. No, totally. Alan, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, lads. We'll preview all the weekend's games with Alan later on in the week as well. A reminder, OTB AM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Munster are back, Owen. It's all coming up you. Yeah, yeah, and they will be back if it's a, an actual win in the Aviva Stadium. That's that's kind of the the final piece of this. Although it does feel that it's, they're one hammering away always from a from a crisis. Yeah, but it's only six points spread for that game. Uh, everybody's a little bit uncertain about what's going to happen. You know, who's going to be back be back at against Munster? Surely they're going to be able to fill the Aviva, price it properly, make it cheap to go, get get all the Lunsters back, get them on board. You know, all of a sudden you're like looking at a it's Fortress Aviva. With the, a good it's, atmosphere at the Viva, wouldn't that be amazing? Dupont and, and Entomac for a reasonable price would be attractive enough for any Irish rugby fan, as well as obviously cheering on Munster. That, I think that's key, I think that's a key point the the pricing of it and making it affordable because yeah. I think yeah, that's obviously dissuading a lot of people from going to live sport at the moment. OTBAM here's what's on sports radio rather for the rest of the day. OTB Gold is Catherine Switzer, the 1967 Boston Marathon Dadcast at three. Career retrospective Jason McAteer at four and OTB Gold is Joe meeting Ruby Walsh at six and then the show is live tonight from seven. We're going to hear from David Myler and Andy Mitten on tonight's Liverpool Manchester United clash tomorrow and much more. We'll leave you this morning with some James O'Connor talking about the weekend's hurling. Enjoy. But we are turning very much to GAA for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Happy to bring in Jamesy O'Connor who has uh, patiently waited for us at Porky Cueve. Jamesy, hello. Joe, how are things? Yeah, very well. So the scoreline is comprehensive. Cork 117, Limerick 225. That's an 11-point win at Porky Cueve. And, uh, you know, worth mentioning, Cork had a three-point head start after 16 seconds. So that is comprehensive. Is that pretty much how it looked in the balance of play as well to you? Yeah, absolutely, Joe. I mean, you know, Limerick, once they, once they found their feet and, you know, started to, to play it the way they play, move the ball through the lines and so on, um, they were just, just you know, looking like the Limerick of old um, you know and four points up at half time having played into a strong breeze Cork did someone a response and you know were level inside you know inside three minutes but what do Limerick do you know score the next five points and suddenly take the game away from Cork again and from there to the end it was you know the game was just played in Limerick's terms um, they had 12 different scorers Joe um, you can find notes here um, 220 from play um, you know I, I don't know what they scored two. I heard a stat 216 from turnovers and just their, their physicality their work rate um, you know the, just their tackling was just ferocious and uh, you know Graham McCahey was corner forward and, and didn't score from play but yes you know his willingness to work to hunt down Cork defenders just to stand them up in the tackle wait for the support to arrive and force turnovers um, you know it's one of the reasons why John Kiley sees the value in that you know why he why he he started obviously today and why he stayed on the pitch for as long as he as long as he did and you know even the subs that came on all made contributions you know Carl O'Neill got two really good scores and um, we all know that you know he's he's a player that's really highly rated and then Pat Ryan came off the bench scored got a great score from the sideline David Reedy scored and I suppose really what what, what we saw today was Mike Casey back at full back um, you know having obviously torn that cruciate um, unable to, to, to regain his starting position um, but he didn't put a foot wrong at full back and that released Dan Morrissey obviously to the half back line he was rock solid um, on one flank Burns was man of the match and absolutely outstanding on, on the other and it meant then that Kyle Hayes um, is operating on, on in, in, in the full forward line um, you know with his ball winning ability with his pace his athleticism his willingness to just put the head down and run straight at you um, it gives Limerick something different and you know Keane Lynch didn't have to be great today. Got one score, Joe, off his knees in the second half, which just has you, you know, you're looking around, shaking your head at, you know, the, the skill level. Galan was good today in patches, without again having to be really, really outstanding. Um, and you know, they just looked like the complete team. And you know, if 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 people were wondering, you know, had they dropped off a level during the league, they they gave their answer this afternoon, and, and it was pretty devastating at times. 
Well, the, the league is very much the league. It's especially true in hurling, whatever about football, but it's especially true in hurling. And right across the league with Limerick, very rarely we saw them play with their All-Ireland final team or anything close to it. I think we saw, was it 13 of the 15 this afternoon? So, look, maybe the squad doesn't stretch on forever. But that first 15, 16, 17, 18, they're as good as ever and seem to be as hungry as ever. For instance, of the uh, 225 today, 220 was from play. And of that 220 from play, 216 came from turnovers. They absolutely killed Cork on turnovers. They did, yeah. And, and, and just the tackling, and you just look at what, what are they doing? But it's, it's the physicality, like that, you know, they, they, they manage to hold you up, or, you know, you half get, get around them. But straight away, there, there's another Limerick player converging. And, and it's that willingness, you know, to, to obviously. Paul Kinnerick and Kylie place huge emphasis emphasis on it, but they have more value in, in the turnover or forcing the Cork guy back than they have in, in, in an exceptional score. That's obviously the currency in their in their in their dressing room. And you know, it's it's that's desire, Joe. That's that's intensely, that's that's your culture and, and that's clearly, you know, set out in stone and, and, and the standards haven't dropped. If anything, they've they've been they've been reset and, and, and look at it's it's three in a row. Um, that's the target, and, 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 and very much, it's 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 in sight. Um, obviously, there's a lot of hurling to be played yet, and, and still, you know, injuries are maybe the one thing that might derail them to key to key players. But uh, yeah, certainly, look at one, one to eighteen. They have the reserves, and they'll obviously have guys to come back. You know, Peter Casey will be making his way back from from injury, and it's a nice um, it's a nice luxury for John Kiley to have. From a Cork perspective, I mean, they may they may well be talking about this championship season as we're going to play Limerick twice, maybe a third time. Let's see who ends up in the Munster final or see how it all plays out. But certainly they are looking at Limerick as the standard and trying to bridge that gap. Now, they were beaten by 16 points in the All-Ireland final uh, today. And it's, a, it's an 11-point gap. You take away the first 16 seconds. It's a 14-point gap in front of a raucous Porky Cueve. Eddie Brennan tweeted midway through the second half, blow it up, it's boys against men. Cork haven't closed the gap at all here. They look at they haven't no. Um, they certainly haven't found the answers to to you know to unlocking the problems obviously the limit the limit present for them now. You know I suppose after half time, you know in fairness they did some of the response. They got the first four scores, but the second of those, you know Seamus Harney put a brilliant ball across um, for Shane Barrett and Nicky Quay pulled off you know a, a brilliant save to deflect it and put it over the bar but Barrett needed to be hitting the deck with that you know yeah. I mean he needed it was a great it. height it was a great height for Quay yeah perfect perfect I mean listen brilliant re- reflexes from Nicky but you know he shouldn't have been in a position to make that to make that save and, and Jack O'Connor flashed one you know narrowly past the post again I think there was maybe you know 56 minutes gone and okay there was still probably you know eight or nine points in it at, at that stage but they need to be taking all those all those chances and you know, there were one or two other occasions when you reckon that, or, or, you know, I, I, I thought that, listen, Cork, they have to get goals. They have to keep going. They have to look to draw the man maybe and, and you know, wait for the runner off the, coming off the shoulder or, or look for more. Um, and they didn't, you know, they were content again to tap it over the bar or to or to take, you know, other options. And that's something that they that they have to look at. But, you know, you don't just go out, Joe, and, and, and pick ball winning half hours off trees um, you know and Limerick have those in, in, in Morrissey they've got it in Hagersey in Kyle Hayes um, in Keane Lynch and Cork Cork just you know couldn't get any traction on their own on their own puck out um, you know they went short and then Limerick quite happy to give the ball to the full back line but then pressured and it went back to the keeper and then he went long but there was absolutely zero change um, from it Burns and Morrissey were just totally dominant um, you know on the on that second, on that second ball or that mm. that long delivery, and you know they effectively had no real platform from which to which to play. Um, now they still scored one seventeen, but as I say, you, you don't just manufacture you know these 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 ball winning half forwards and and teams that win all Ireland's invariably have them. You know Kilkenny obviously had them for years. You know what I mean? Marin Comerford, you can go back to John Hine, guys like that. Um, you know Richie Power, Henry obviously, Eddie Brennan. They were all able to win their own ball, and and Cork just just. You know, don't seem to have those type of players, and and the middle third, you know, even Willow Donahue, um, you know, just the enforcer, just the physicality, the work rate. I mean, there was one point there where you know we know Mark Coleman is quick, and Coleman took off up along the the, the, the sideline here in front of me, deep into the second half, and I don't know who was after him. You know, bursting a gut, closing the gap, and again, it, you know, Coleman forced him to play a ball that I think was intercepted, and 
you know, but if 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 Willow Dunhu doesn't burst the gut and expend that energy, um, Mark Coleman has 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 time to to pick out the pass, and and that was the biggest difference for me. That you know, the work rate between the between the teams and, and the Cork forwards, you know, there's, there's there's no way of putting this any other way. They just don't work as hard as as, as remotely as hard as the Limerick forwards do, and. You know, just watching some of the RTE footage on the, on, on, on the player here, um, Joe, you know, I think th- th- they highlighted that, that, you know, Limerick were effectively able to work the ball almost the length of the field without, without a glove and lay it on them by Cork. And, and clearly, you know, that's, that's not going to get it done against, against the champions. That's very frustrating if you're a Cork fan hearing that. There's no reason as to why Limerick should be working harder than your forward line. There isn't, no. Um, and sometimes, you know, you, you, you're, looking, you're looking at it and, and you're saying, you know, is that... Is, is that just tokenism? You know, there's a half-hearted effort maybe in the tackle. And you look at Graham Mulcahy, probably the smallest man, um, you know, on the field. And yet, and consistently, you know, in, in, un, under Kylie, anytime Graham Mulcahy has played, it's, you know, he, he sometimes sets the tone in terms of his willingness just to put his body on the line and, and force turnovers and, and, and put the hard yards in. And, and you know, really, um, it, it just doesn't seem to be in the makeup of, of, of some of these Cork forwards. And look, they're good players and they're talented and they're very, very quick and very, very skillful. Um, but there's more to the game than that. And, you know, Limerick have that have that in their DNA. Yes. And, and, and that, that willingness to work hard just doesn't seem to be something that, that Cork possess enough of. And, and maybe look at it, the Brian Cody mantra. Sometimes, Joe, is you've got to, you know, if, if the other type of players you need, you've got to go out and find them. Yeah, and it's a boring point and it's a stating the obvious point, but it does have to start with hard work in hurling. You know, it's such a wild game. It's about the small moments. You have to win as many of those moments. And the Mulcahy point is a good one to make because there would be a temptation to look at the size, just the physical size of Limerick and say, well, how can anyone compete with that? But Mulcahy bears out the point that it's about more than size. It's about a certain attitude. Oh yeah, and, and listen, and Graham Mulcahy has put the hours into the gym. You can see that. Listen, physically, he's developed. He's he's he looks a lot stronger than the the wispy Graham Mulcahy that, that came onto the Limerick team. You know when he made his when he made his debut, but but he didn't score. And I might have said it to you at half time that listen, you know he got no change out of out of Niall O'Leary. But I just thought the second half, just his, you know when when Cork obviously started so well and and you know as I said we're we're level three minutes into the second half and you're wondering now are we going to get a game here maybe playing into the breeze might suit Cork a little bit more maybe they can get that running game going but uh, but Limerick just shut it down and as I said I, I just thought he was to the fore um, you know in, in, in doing that and not letting Cork out of their own half of the field and you know if that status accurate 216 from turnovers it, is, yeah. it, it, it speaks volumes Joe for, for the work rate that Limerick that Limerick, uh, Limerick showed and, and, and he epitomised it it's hard listening to you to feel in any way confident that Cork will win the All-Ireland this year or push for an All-Ireland. I mean, you'd, you'd kind of write them off on the basis of being beaten so comprehensively at the pork. Yeah, well, Joe, look at... Like, the first objective of, of all the teams in the provinces is, is, is be, be in the three, the top three, to, to, to come out. And, you know, listen, Munster is, is going to be a, a bear fight. I mean, you know, Tip obviously showed something today down in, um, you know, down in Walsh Park that... You know they, they have their pride, and there's still a lot of players in that tip dressing room. You know, Cahill Barrett, you know, Michael Breen, Ronan Maher, Jason, Jason Ford, etc., with, with the Ireland medals. And, um, you know, and I thought I, I saw obviously pieces of it, and I thought Mark Hugh did, did, did well. Um, and they're not going to lie down for, for anybody. I mean, you know, tip obviously have a story rivalry with Cork, they've obviously a huge rivalry with them, um, with, 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 with Limerick. Claire, obviously, go, go to Turles. You know, next Sunday, massive game for both um, for both counties. So, I mean, look at, you know, Cork. That's Cork's first priority. They, they've got to win at least two matches and um, make sure then that they're they're in the last six. And from there, then I mean, you know, that that gives you a chance. That gives you time to maybe iron out some of those deficiencies. Maybe maybe go back to the drawing board. Um, but just at, at this point in time, you know, Darrell Fitzgibbon, you know, after some really brilliant stuff during the league. No, got, got a point in the first half no real impact on the game today yeah. Mark Coleman again you know minimal enough impact uh, and, who, and who was centre you know, back James he was a Coleman yeah well, well Jerry Miller attached himself to kind of Keane Keen Lynch and um, and Coleman was kind of Coleman was centre back but at times he was he was out in the he was out in the wing and okay. you know it, it was just 
the game just it just seemed to be played on Lim- on Limerick's terms. You know, yeah. Kyle Hayes at, at times kind of came out in the first half. Kyle Hayes was kind of out operating and centre forward, and, and Damien Cahalan was effectively playing kind of centre playing centre back with with Sean O'Donoghue who was was on Galan and Nigel Leary on on Graham Mulcahy inside. But then the second half, you know, there was times when Hayes was was always playing corner forward, and Colm was kind of out at centre back. So, you know, Limerick or Cork obviously had their had their matchups, but. Um, but the, the, just the quality of ball coming in, you know, into that Limerick forward line, um, you know, was was superb. But the reason it was superb was because invariably the Limerick players had time to to, yes. to to get their heads up and pick out the right pass. Whereas at the other end, you know, it, it's 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 always pressured, pressurised ball. And you know, if you're playing the Limerick full back line, you know, you can afford to attack the ball because you know it's 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 you know the pressure's been applied out the out the field and. And, and that makes it, that makes their jobs easier. Yes, everyone's on the front foot. So almost the way you're kind of presenting it, there's a degree of uh, where when Cork have the ball and they're building out from defence, the Limerick forwards smell opportunity here and a turnover here akin to, you know, Liverpool and Gagan pressing. When the Limerick defenders have the ball, the Cork forwards are almost thinking, oh, I suppose I have to go and close this guy down now. Well, I, and maybe that's been a bit harsh on, on, on the Cork forwards. I mean, they were, they were wondering, Look at the rare occasions when Cork did apply pressure, but Limerick too are so efficient, so well drilled, so you know prepared that you know when when if Mike Casey takes a short puck off Nicky Quaid, you know it's the second ball, Joe. It's it's ping to hand. You know what I mean? It's out to Willow Dunne who or somebody has made themselves available. Suddenly there's a guy coming off the shoulder. Dan Morris, he's on the sidelines, popped out to him. He's time to get his head up and, and, and pick a pass to somebody. So you 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 got to give Limerick huge credit too mm. for. The, the level at which they're executing, Joe. I mean, this is like, you know, we sometimes underestimate just how good and how skillful what they're doing is. I mean, yeah. it, you know, picking out passes that are sticking to hand to guys on the run, they don't have to break stride. Um, clearly, they train that way, um, and that enables them to play that way. And obviously, Paul Kinnerk is the architect of it, and, and you know what a coach, what a coach he is. And as I said, look at it, you know, like they, they weren't scoring goals up to last year's championship. They obviously corrected that, yeah. and even the second half, Galan had one that he flashed narrowly over the the, the, the crossbar that could just as easily have, have, have been, you know, nestling in the top the top corner. So that threat is still is still there, and obviously with Hayes up front, he gives them something different, a different dimension. So, um, yeah, look at. They're, they're the team, Joe. Yeah. If, if if we had any doubts about it, they're they're the ones that they all have to beat. And, and yeah. Liam Cahill, uh, Liam Cahill will will have no doubts about how difficult the challenge will be next Saturday night in the Gaelic Grounds. So to be fair, then, because they this all might sound a touch harsh on, on Cork. Today is just a reinstatement of the uh, qualities of Limerick. Today's more about and the gap between these two teams. It is it is far more about Limerick's brilliance than than the shortcomings of Cork. Is that that would be the fair way of putting this? I, I I think so. I mean, listen, look. at Look, Cork supporters and, and, and Cork hurling men will probably, you know, they, they won't have been happy with, with, with today, um, you know, and obviously the way the way it went, and you know, but look at Kieran Kingston can only work with the players that he's got, and, and these are probably the best players in Cork, and maybe people might feel that, you know, Tim Mahoney needs to be further up the field, or maybe needs to be centre back, or Mark Coleman needs to be shoved forward, um, you know, maybe Darrell Leary you know, might, might come in the edge of the square, but I didn't think Demi Callan did a whole lot did a whole lot wrong today. Um, it's just the middle, the middle third, Joe. I mean, that half back line, Burns was Burns was just imperious um, yeah. at wing back. I mean, you know, and even when Cork, you know, Cork were coming at them, he got a, a, a phenomenal point, um, you know, from 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 play, uh, and and just literally won almost everything that came down came down his side. Dan Morrissey on the other wing was every bit as good, um, and obviously O'Donoghue and O'Donovan. It's not that, it's not that they're particularly stylish or that they, you know, they. They, they kill you with skill, but what they do in terms of just the simple things and the defending and 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 you know doing the donkey work, um, you know, and then you've you've obviously got Hagerty who looked back to his best today and Morrissey working incredibly hard on the on on the wing. So the mid the, the middle third, they have the players, they have the athletic athleticism, they have the physicality, the power, the strength, uh, and it makes it very very hard to play to that middle third with with with, with the attributes that that, that that team has. Yeah, Burns was a deserved man of the match. Scored some brilliant long range frees as well when Cork had started so well and Limerick just needed to steady the ship. And then as you said, any ball that went in, I'm not sure what height he is, but he just looks like he's impossible to beat in the air. He is, yeah. I mean and, and that's the one thing again and again I you know it goes back to Paul Kinnerk and, and, and coaching. I mean, you know, Kilkenny for, for years obviously dominated the 
you know, aerially. They were so good um, in, in, in the air. But, you know, Kinnerk, obviously, I think, has, has coached Limerick, um, you know, in terms of, OK, breaking it down. You know, how, how do you compete for a ball in the air? And Limerick now, we're arguably every bit as good as, as the Kinney were. And, you know, when you're Dermot Burns and you're <laughs> six feet five and you're Grode Hagerty and you're six feet five or six and you're Kyle Hayes and you're a similar size and yeah. Dan Morrissey is a small and the other the other wing either um, you know it's it's it's, 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 a, it's a big help and they have that physical advantage as well and, and they make it count and you know puck outs obviously are so important shots are so important turnovers are so important and I think you look at all those three probably the three most important statistical categories uh, Limerick win those hands down and, and they certainly won them hands down today yeah I know. I mean, there's, there's just no easy, easy way to beat them. Groach Hegarty, six foot five. Him. It's funny. Every time, I mean, he, he's like his physique is just phenomenal. And then when he takes off his helmet to be interviewed, it's like someone has photoshopped a different head in him. This baby-faced assassin. <laughs> you know, they, you forget like some of them are so young. And then like there's a moment where Keen Lynch, who was awe-inspiring in the All Ireland final, as you said today, you know, it wasn't a spectacular Lynch display. It was a stitching it together kind of a day for Lynch. But then, like, he goes and scores a, a point off his knees, you know, like he's genuflecting and, and whips one over, just to remind everyone I'm here too. Yeah, and, and again, the thing the thing with Keith Lynch is, you know, his, his just willingness to do, you know, Joe, the, the, the hard work. Um, you know, he, he he's always tackling. He's, you know, he's winning the, 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 the dirty ball. And... You know, you, you just get the sense that um, you know that there's no no egos in that in, in, in that team. That they play for each other. They play for they play for the jersey. Um, and and you know if you if you're not putting not putting it in, you you don't play. And um, you know successful and an Ireland winning teams have that. You have to have that. And, and Limerick have it in spades. And you know Lynch, as I said, was as good as he needed to be today. Um, you know, I remember been down here in Parky Key for, for the Munster final last year and even the first half when Tip were on top, I thought himself and Kyle Hayes were the two guys that, that were looking to take the fight to Tip and and you know, he he wanted the ball, he demanded the ball and more than anybody else I think he got Limerick, he got Limerick moving and we know, you know, the level the levels to which he can he, he can play and, and obviously his skill level and uh, but it's as I said, it's just his, his honesty and his work rate and what he brings um to the team in that department. Uh you know, he's He's just a perfect team player. OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 